So, welcome to Your Irish Connection. We're having chats about how we do these Irish spirituality things with myself, Laura O'Brien. And today we have Anshkeli Bjog, who is a Dagda Bard. And we will find out all about that in a few minutes. So there he is, his fine form. Um, he's a total nerd, not just about Irish mythology, um, as you can see from Star Wars and Superman in one hit. You know, what can you do? So you're very welcome. Um, would you like us to call you Anshkeli Bjog? Or would you prefer to go by your, your name that your mammy gave you? <laughs> um, Shkeli Bjog is a bit of a mouthful. And given that it's Irish translation for a little storyteller, it was always a bit of a personal joke. Um, the name my mammy gave me is Jonathan Edward. And so that's probably equally a mouthful. So I think the best thing to go is just John. Just John. Just John. Just just John. John. Okay, well, John, you're very welcome, and um, I've been looking forward to doing this interview, so let's get started. So, um, when and where did your interest in Irish spirituality begin? Um, I suppose I'm very, very fortunate in where I was born, which is the island of Ireland itself. Um, so I didn't really have to go very far beyond my front doorstep or down the road or even primary education or like first level schooling to experience Irish folklore and Irish kind of impact um, and history. Spirituality though is something that I always find developed over time. Um, I started as a, a good little Catholic boy, in fact the Catholic Boy Scouts back when they were both Catholic and boys only. Um, but I think for me, going beyond religion, going beyond faith, um, spirituality began at home, um, exposed to my mother and her faith, um, and the kind of impacts along family, really. Okay. So how did you practically go about getting started when you started to figure out that you might be more inclined towards a, let's say, non-traditional Irish uh, spirituality, as in, you know, if Catholicism wasn't going to do it for you, um, you were looking about. So how did you get started with books, courses, events, people you met? Where did you first kind of become introduced to paganism as a thing? Um, that was actually a very, very long road to find. And it seems I was all over that road before I even gave it the name. Um, early on, I learned to I learned that there was a disparity in what we were taught about Christianity and what was experienced about Catholicism. So um, that really started my first questions. Um, if this book is supposed to say one thing, but people are living something different, how can it really be what it should be? How can it really be um, the only way to experience faith or the only way to experience divinity? Um, um, so I began to question and from there I began to move on to just anything and everything I could experience. Um, I, I got copies of various sort of books. I spoke to friends who were from, of the Islam faith. I spoke to people who were, you know, Hebrew, Jewish faith. I've kind of read books to try to expose myself to as much as I could um, even picked up on like runic work, like, you know, the Norse runes and you know, that kind of pantheon. Um, it was a bit of a long road going through all of those things. Um, I think... <sighs> Every person is on a spiritual quest, a spiritual journey themselves. Um, when it came down to particular resources, I was just connecting with whatever I could connect with open-mindedly without um, reservation or without kind of you know, blinkering myself, just kind of expose myself to as much as possible. Now, it did lead to some very interesting experiences in regards to some of the more what, entertaining aspects of spirituality in certain ways. Um, certain kind of cult factions of Christianity and, you know, the, the hardcore doctrine extremists that you find in almost any particular faith um, was always an interesting kind of step carefully. Um, but I, I wouldn't say I was ever academically trained or academically picked up. Um, it was whatever I could really get my hands on. Um, I began to really step beyond the idea of religion and move more towards the idea of faith because to me, 
religion has its place. It's the structure, it's the pathway that kind of takes someone through a process to understand the connection to divinity, whatever that divinity may be or deity. Um, but once you get to the point of having that face-to-face conversation or that direct connection, do you really need a third party kind of telling you what you should be understanding about deity? Um, now, of course, you know, it, there is a place for priesthood. There is a place for clergy in any different aspect for you know greater support kind of community support um specialist knowledge in particular areas but to me it's always got to connect with the individual and the path that they're on i don't know if that's a well, thing from that information it's covering it generally but um i also would like to know how you you know, like you were here in Ireland. So as a touch point, you know, rather than kind of generally, like as a touch point, what kind of books or courses or events or people did you meet like within the pagan community in Ireland? And, you know, what were your first experiences of that when you actually started to realize what paganism is or who was involved yeah. or those kind of things? Fair. Um, I began to kind of step beyond the ideas of, religion and dogma and then you know spirituality and faith became a personal thing for me um exposure to the pagan community actually came from my older sister my eldest sister janice um who's been a long time pagan um like it, it just seemed a different way of connecting to deity to me so i never really had a problem with it at all um one particular year i think it was maybe four years five years ago she was involved in a pagan community event in Dublin called Fela Drieta. Um, Fela Drieta. <laughs> and yeah, it was a community event organized by a pair of lovely professional ladies, Laura <laughs> O'Brien and Barbara Lee. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Kind of, <laughs> well, who wanted to kind of bring space for like pagan community to interact with each other, to kind of share and to kind of educate each other, but also to just to trade and to kind of support each other as a, a, a group. So I'd never heard of this before. My eldest sister was staff manager at the event and in a bit of a, a challenge over having people that she could rely upon to fill certain roles within the event. And so I volunteered. Um, at that point, I began to interact with a greater community and I began to see a lot of, you know, what was normal day to day kind of experience for people's lives. Um, you know, it, spirituality and faith doesn't have to alter how you interact day to day it's just a, an extra facet of who and what you choose to be um so interacting with that community gave me some nice insights some kind of great kind of workshops and kind of just roaming around access to more data and more books which was always great and great conversations with people who are willing to share and willing to discuss um at that point i became apparently exceedingly useful and my involvement in Fela Drieta was became no longer optional yep. and so for the next three years I fulfilled the role of retail support and, and Mr. MC at particular points running like charity raffles which were always a really part of the event so as far as people um, I'd say Janet my eldest sister um, was the first exposure which kind of normalized it for me which coming from a, a very Christian Catholic family was a bit difficult um, for her to have that difference and to have that difference acknowledged when you have a mother who's very, you know, very Catholic and Christian. And absolutely, it's a, it's a fantastic, beautiful kind of thing to have such a strong face. Um, that's kind of where I got it from as well. But moving beyond the baseline understanding of what's always been handed to me as Christian and Catholicism, and then going out into the the wilds of kind of religious wilderness to try and hack or find my own path to understanding divinity or deity and through that myself. Um, I, I, it's, it's always been very interesting as an experience. Hmm. Okay. So what sort of things do you do on a daily or weekly or monthly or seasonal basis to explore or express your Irish spirituality? <laughs> um, I was kind of dreading the, this kind of question um, <laughs> because I don't have any formalized training. I don't have any academia behind my own path of things. And I've always been very intuitive in what I feel fits at any given moment. Um, daily and monthly, like, you know, whether it comes down to an understanding of self or just being me as a human. My daily practices have always been about self-care. 
Um, I can't be of use to anyone else in this world unless I'm out at a first step of use to myself. Um, whether that is part of a, just a, a mental process of my own existence or whether that is something that I can attribute to in some intent like deity or divinity or spirituality um, is a question I'm yet to answer in any detail or satisfaction way for myself. Um, my relationship with the lovely Laura O'Brien has begun to expose me to monthly and seasonal based practices. Um, as a kid growing up, you know, there was always a celebration of Christmas. Christmas falls around Yule. There was always a, an awareness of Lunasa in autumn. You know, there was always an awareness of Bielsena because, you know, some of the Irish language and the Irish names of the months still kind of fit directly from those festivals and periods. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, I never really had a way of actively expressing it as a, a personal individual. Um, but I would always kind of turn up and support for any kind of group or individuals or friends or communities that I'm connected with to support them in their practices wherever I can or wherever I can do to facilitate. Um, There are times um, I had the fortune, fortune, misfortune maybe, of um, living out in Navan for a period of time uh, right close to the Hill of Tara, and that's where I really began to connect my own self to the land. Um, And so... Whether it was, well, I, I, every day I'd pretty much go for a walk around the Hill of Tara for exercise with the hound, the dog. Um, so whether that was in some subconscious practice, subconscious kind of exploration of spirituality um, is something that I later considered and began to understand more. So I do try and give much back to that space, which gave a lot to me. Um, yeah, well, I think that that counts, John, because it's, you know, you weren't just walking around the local park like you actually had to get in your car and go and drive from Navan to Tara it's not you know it's not within strolling distance of your house so you were going to Tara for a particular reason like you were going there because of the spiritual exploration or the draw the connection that you were feeling like you know there are there are other places that are less spiritual or or non-spiritual you know you weren't going walking around the local car park you were going to the hill of fucking Tara so yes I would think that 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 would count towards exploration of your Irish spirituality. Me. That's fair. Yeah, no, I, I can understand that. Um, like when I break that place down, even seasonally, um, you name name an event, I was probably there on Tara for it. Um, even as recently as a few years ago, just one Christmas Eve, I was up in Dublin and I was like, you know what I need? I need the hill. So I just took drive out and kind of parked up and I was walking around just looking at the stars on a cold winter night when my phone beeped and went, you know, hey, yeah, it's now 25th of December. So New Year's Day, I've done up there as well. You know, any kind of change or shift of season, I, um, I don't know if it's been exactly on a particular recognized kind of shift or recognized turning point. Um Because, again, I don't have the, the knowledge or the history or the stuff behind that. I just have always known where I needed to be when I needed to be there okay so let's go back a little bit to your um you were saying about doing kind of self-care thing and how your self-care is actually an expression of your spirituality and like I'm finding that interesting particularly in light of you know your your relationship with the Dagda who is you know to all intents and purposes he's he's one of the most physical of the gods if you like um so I'm interested in your like, pr- like practical examples of what you would do on a daily, weekly, or whenever basis that, you know, you're, you're relating self care like to your spirituality. How does that look for you? Um, it's yeah. I think I got to take it from the first kind of awareness of self. Um, as you begin to kind of break down your spiritual path and your spiritual growth, um, it almost leads to, in some circumstances, individuals who miss out on the physical and go straight up, straight after the spiritual. Now, individuals who haven't had a lot of balance or haven't had an exposure to spirituality as a baseline in their existence tend to chase this new aspect of reality for them. And it's very powerful and it's very, very attractive. But if they miss or lose the baseline of the the physical humanity um, it can cause problems so 
for me, um, having challenging experiences when I did in my own time, um, I had to kind of break it back to what's my minimum baseline and an awareness of self. So understanding that, you know, there's multiple versions of John, be it like, you know, the John that everyone else perceives, the John that exists in my own head and the John that has to be able to get up every day and function onto this. Um, I just really got in the habit of having a shower every day. It was a, a baseline process for me from a, a human perspective. Um, but it also gave me a, a space where I would just physically run the water over me and intentionally clean myself. Um, now, when you're an individual who tends to get stuck into other people's challenges to help them out um, or other circumstances or areas to kind of support work that you know you, you tend to pick up a lot of stuff over time so um daily energetically kind of pick yeah up energetic. yeah okay yeah it's it happens you know it's it's as we interact with our world around us that there's a lot more to it um and when you begin to accept the reality of energy impact or energy transference like you walk in and you kind of meet someone they always make you feel fantastic and you feel great or you know you're helping out someone who's down in the dumps or having a difficult time and there's the draining element of that you know it's it's gonna have an impact so being able to take uh, a space solely for me to just be well literally naked me underneath the water to just be clearing of my own process and to just be very physical very aware of just myself in that space um became a very solid baseline for me um so <laughs> as i began to grow and experience the awareness of dagda as a deity and dagda as a a divine interest in my existence um I, i've begun to appreciate that yeah he is someone who really gets the the human stuff probably better than most um and is willing to make allowances and kind of appro like appropriate kind of gaps for people to, to adjust their baseline and be as human as they need to be to carry on hmm. um, so I think it's understandable that like that kind of process kind of fits with that and acknowledging that you're human form first you're a very baseline physical creature and if you're going to be the best servant or support or functioning member of your spiritual community then you have to have a, a physical baseline as well yeah, I don't know anything about that. Um, okay, well, yeah. so moving on. Um, <laughs> how important is it to you personally to be in Ireland physically? So obviously when you travel, um, now these are, are general questions and some people that I interview are obviously not living in Ireland. So this is the main reason that that question is here. But for you mm. growing up in Ireland, um, you know, like we've kind of touched on your connection to Tara, what do you get from being on the land like what do you get from how, how do you relate to the island itself to the, the land physically um i think i only really began to be aware of my connection to ireland physically when i began to leave ireland um it's just that awareness like it, you don't really realize what you have until you don't have it anymore mm. um, now i did not start traveling like i came up in a, a middle to low income family like you know with four sisters father ex-army and a mother who has worked very hard to support us financially so foreign holidays was not a not a thing to ever exist for me um it was only when i was into my 20s and working full-time that i managed to kind of get money together to go away with my friends for the first time but even then you know there wasn't an awareness of distance from ireland because I was just exploring it for the first time. Um, since becoming more spiritual as a person, becoming more awake um, to the energy connection of my land around me, um, I do rely on it a heck of a lot. Um, I'm the kind of person who just stamps his feet on the ground, <laughs> literally everywhere, <laughs> no matter where it would be, no matter who would need to be annoyed by me. Standing yes, me. Mr. Stompy, we know. <laughs> yeah, well, if, if I'm, I'm the kind of person who just takes a lot of support from that. Um, but also does a lot of work with that, um, which we might be able to touch on as the earth deity later on. Mm -hmm. um, but going beyond Ireland, going beyond the ninth wave, as it were, um, to other lands and beginning to experience other landscapes and the energy imprint of those was a very interesting experience for me. Um, it wasn't 
as challenging as I know it can be for other people leaving the island. Mm. Uh, but there is, there's, there's an acknowledgement here that, you know, there, there's something a little bit other <laughs> to the island. And mm. I'm very, very fortunate to be here. And, you know, the more I kind of learn about the, the land behind the, my general awareness, my, the, the land that exists outside of my five senses. The um, other world. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, want, I was trying to keep it specifically to the other <laughs> island. The other <laughs> island, maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, but the more I begin to experience that with senses beyond the five basic ones, shall we say, um, the more I'm beginning to value it. Okay. And so you should. Um, if you could make every person beginning this path, uh, this path being spirituality, Irish spirituality specifically, if you could make them read just one book, what would it be? So if you could guarantee every single person that you came across, if you could guarantee that like they had read at least this book, what would that book be? Um, an interesting one and it was one of those questions again that i was dreading darling thank you very much um you had warning <laughs> I, I know i know i know um my my initial kind of process would be to recommend um for probably your book but i don't want that to come across as a, a shameless promoter plug for my other half and darling who puts a lot of work in and uh, practical guide to our spirituality because it's not just um exposing people to a baseline spirituality it's it's actually giving them tools it's giving them kind of actionable processes and steps to to begin to explore that spirituality themselves um so laura o'brien's practical guide to irish spirituality mm -hmm. um, but I would also say that wherever you can find the folklore you know if I could get everyone to read the baseline folklore you know maybe Morgan Daimler's kind of translations of it because she's amazing mm -hmm. um, story archaeology kind of listen to Isolde and Christine because they're amazing you know and it's Chris, very kind of, not Chris, Chris sorry thank mm -hmm. you pardon Chris, Chris and Isolde um, they're, they're amazing to hear, you know, and it exposes people to the the lore and the literature and the story um, that has formed the island and made it what it is. And I think to be able to focus particularly on Irish spirituality and to get an understanding of what that would mean to an individual, what that would mean to a person's spiritual growth and practice, you got to look to what's left. You got to look to what we have of that. And that is the, the stories. That is what we carry forward, like our folklore and our lore that kind of generates where all of this stuff comes from. Hmm. So not a particular book, but that's, that's how I would recommend someone go about it. Okay. So what advice do you wish someone had given you that you would like to give people starting out on this path? So, you know, you've talked about a kind of a, a wandery introduction to paganism and, you know, you maybe had a, a later start um, than you could have um, on getting to know all this stuff. So if you could go back and give yourself advice or if you met somebody who's in your position, what advice would you give them? Um, question everything. Hmm. That would be a baseline. Um, for a lot of people, when it comes to like, you know, first exposures to spirituality, first exposures to religion, it's what they get at home. It's what they're provided by their society, their state, their community, whatever it is. And it's easy. You know, that's, oh, well, that's what my parents have always done. So that's what I should do. You know, genuflect in church, go get the wafer, whatever it is, you know. But anyone I think who, really wants to begin a spiritual path, really wants to kind of get their feet under them, needs to start with the questions. You know, you got to be able to look at, you know, well, transubstantiation, like, you know, what is that? You know, why do, should I, you know, follow this particular dogma? You know, why do I need to consider monotheism instead of polytheism? You know, why is one better than the other? You know, why is there a circumstance? And being able to kind of embrace the why, not as a a burden not as a you know disruptive element or not as any anyone who won't give you time of day to answer your question 
um, be it like well thought out and well asked questions, you know, is probably just not aware of the fact that they should be questioning themselves. And if your questions, if the answers to your questions just solidify you in your belief and in your particular faith or system, then even better, you know. But it is about having the willingness to question, you know, having the willingness to go beyond what's presented to you and to make it your own. Hmm. That is a good one. I try. <laughs> so we are on to other people's questions now. And if anybody has any questions, um, anybody here who's listening, please throw them into the chat and we'll get to those as well. Um, Meg's questions here. So I, I, I should not read the chat, right? You, you'll read the chat and ask I'll me the question. The chat. Yeah, don't worry about that. I'll okay. read that. I, I, could, I could get distracted. Got your back, Sam. Don't worry. Um, so, <laughs> shush. Um, so Meg's questions came in on a separate thread, and then we'll get to the the kind of main thread from the Irish Magic and Spirituality Group, where the bulk of the questions came in. But first off. We have Meg Baker Heal. So I think she's in the chat here. Hi, Meg. Um, she Hi, says. Meg. The good God is always giving. How do you see the cycle of reciprocity that makes this sustainable? Yeah. Um, it's a very kind of interesting question. And, you know, I'm delighted to, to you know, have connected with so many people to kind of bring the questions forward. I was kind of in a panic of like, like it, it's going to be five minutes. Literally, we go through it. I'll just answer questions. I won't talk. And that'll be it to be over. Um, but well, to get if to you the response that you're um, going to go through a whole interview and not talk, that's just ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> just okay, all right, right, right. Come on, stop being silly. All right. Um, but I'm delighted to get so many questions from the community. I think um, it's the most questions we've actually ever had um, on well, any maybe of I'm, these. Maybe I'm the most desperate person who needed support. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think that's why, John. That's not why. Yeah. So anyway, um, next question. So to, to um, get to the questions. Okay. Mm. Um, with all of these things, as I began to go through and read the questions and get an understanding of them, I had to first acknowledge that whatever really comes across is going to be hugely based on my own personal gnosis, personal experiences, and my own view of what's actually happening here. Because particularly with the data, as we look, well, uh, I say we, um, when I really mean me, as I look around Ireland, I, I couldn't point to a data group. I couldn't kind of point to someone else who, you know, is specifically aligned in that way. You know, even going beyond having had the, the joy of traveling to other pagan communities around the world, where are the data people? I know four. <laughs> you know, I, I probably know two who are specifically data and other people who are like, yeah, well, he's kind of just here because of the rest of them. Um, so whatever I kind of come out with is through the lens of my own experience. And I suppose hopefully that's enough caveats and addendums and whatever, mm -hmm. um, to get to the questions themselves then, um, Dagda is a very, very big character in the stories and in folklore and then also in my experience and my kind of practice with him as deity. Um, he's directly connected with the, one of the four treasures of the two of the Dan and out of Murias, the cauldron of plenty. And the stories tell us that this cauldron would never, well, actually what it specifically says is that any company coming to this cauldron would never leave unsatisfied. Um, so the idea of hospitality is very much built into Dagda as a deity. It's one of the kind of key aspects to him. And of course, that is a very, very giving circumstance from our current understanding of it when you go back into the culture at the time you know someone offering hospitality you know the the guest had an onus as well to provide or to give in response to that it wasn't just all take you know when you accept someone's hospitality you know you had to either give support you had to kind of give work you had to give you know even a story you know, there's, there's multiple kind of stories of, of, you know, people offering a story or offering a tale, any scale of good, any stories in you, you know. Um, so the cycle of reciprocity, to be able to kind of instill that and make it sustainable, it's it's got to start with a baseline of you as a human. It's got to start with you or, you know, me in this instance, making sure I'm looking after my human needs so that I am in a position to provide when I'm requested to. Um, 
there are going to people be people who don't reciprocate. You know, it's just not in them. It's not where they are, or they may not have anything to give other than gratitude. Um, for anyone working with him or for him or me, you got to look after number one, but not at the expense of number two, three, four, five, and six. You know, it's for the benefit of everyone who comes after you that you have to have your baseline. Like, you know, if I'm not in a fit circumstance to talk to people, you won't hear from me. You just won't hear my voice. But when I am, I will give as much as I can, you know, and I think that's how sustainable may have to be the key word on that. Like, you know, the sustainability only comes from your managed ability and your managed awareness around what it takes to give. Um, Now he's got really big shoulders. He's got a lot that he can actually give. And if you're working through an aspect of working for him um, just be prepared to, you know, give as much as he can pass through you at any particular point. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, I think so. Um, and Meg, if you've any kind of follow-ups on us, please, again, throw them in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, will you speak to how the Dagda relates to the modern Irish landscape with the dead and the current religious communities? Now, I have very, very strong feelings on the current religious communities, um, who I don't even class as, well, say the main one, I don't even class as a religious community. They're the fucking criminal organization who run the country from back rooms and ministries. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, so I, I won't get involved in this question, but um, I am interested as well in the answer. How do you think the Dagda relates to us now, us in the here and now? Um, with the dead and the ancestors and everything that's going on in Ireland right now? Um, I think as I began to explore the stories and as I began to explore my connection to him through story, um, things began to change. I, I was looking for the, the angles in the old stories that would give more clarity to what the character is. Because what, what we were left with from the, the original kind of folklore is mishmashes of caricature almost you know these exacerbated ideals of what this character is large obese heavy set you know huge appetites you know massive cock whatever it is you know um but to kind of get beyond that i started with these older stories and you know because he's a chieftain he becomes king so if you're going to have someone who's going to become that they're not going to be a slovenly oaf you know because you, you wouldn't get to being a chieftain for that what surprised me was, as I began writing these stories, other stories began to pop up, stories based in the now. Um, and they're all available on my blog. You know, they're there for reading. But it was the idea that if deity exists and if this concept of an ever-living focus or entity or divinity that has always existed in the world and the realms they're going to adapt and they're going to change. But the baseline cores of them, the, the archetypal kind of bottom layer of who and what they are will always be the same. And when we go to the bottom layers of Dagda, we got someone who is always going to be willing to put in the work. He's always going to be willing to do what needs to be done to improve things or to change things or to build things or to support the community. You know, and I honestly don't think that's changed. He's very patient as far as my experiences that have been. And with the current modern Irish landscape, he's just always been doing what he's been doing. He's been just, just carrying on, kind of working through the process, you know, taking care of the things that aren't being taken care of or taking care of the things he's being asked to be taken care of. Um, as I began to connect more with it, I, I began to have deep sadnesses, um, which I realized weren't exactly my own. And it was an awareness that, you know, for all of the huge heart and the huge kind of work that this deity has been put in in the past and through the stories, if that character, and because, well, in my belief, that character existing today is not, as we go back to the question, getting reciprocity for the effort he's been putting in, then he's going to feel taken advantage of. He's going to feel drained. He's going to feel down. You know, I wrote a particular story. Um, Funny enough, it's called All Life Is Stories. Yeah. And it was 
it surprised and sidelined me when it came out, but it was him going into hospital. And it was him going in where no one else would go. It was him going to the people who the community had forgotten and being with them when they passed. And as part of that story, like no one saw him, no one recognized him, no one knew his name, no one called out to him, no one poured a drink for him, no one like made him a sandwich, but he still did the thing. Now, the story has a happy ending. No spoilers, go read it. Or I'll tell you, like, you know, there's an acknowledgement at the end of it that maybe on some level, there's always at least some who will recognize, some who will see that acknowledge. And through that acknowledgement, we get that reciprocity, that appreciation. Okay, full disclosure here. As you're talking, my, uh, I just got this, oh, for a dear, or McCree, McCree. Um, I'm actually really, upset by that at the thought of and I don't think I've ever in my life been upset at the thought of a poor oh poor deity like you know um but that's actually after really getting to me I I, I never considered you know the the poor El forgotten dag to like still doing the work you know it was like when the gods were being forgotten they kind of they faded away or they went and did, did their own things and whatever but actually now that I'm thinking about it the dagda is so he's intertwined here. yeah he's so intertwined with community and he's so like he's not going to fade into the background he's he has he must have been here all this time just oh i'm actually quite upset now well that's, <laughs> take a breath Dan, and, and you know, <laughs> acknowledge that it's not you it's him and that is something that's really kind of hit me before and it's something that i have to be very careful with when i'm working on that and sit beside him but don't let him kind of yeah, um, that is so connected with the land. Like, you know, when we go back to the original stories, it's him who built Brunabonia. It's him who built all the brews, all the kind of hostels and all the homes. You know, when the Milesians came, it was actually him who made the space for them to connect in and to go further on. You know, it's, it's him in the land of the land. You know? And of all of the deities that I've experienced, he's the one who's the most physical. You know, if you take herself, um, she's very ephemeral. You know, like she will change and she will move um, to whatever form is needed for the purpose. He's talking he about not. the Morrigan, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, she's going to answer questions later. But him, he's, he's the immovable object. He's the rock. He's the land, you know. Yeah. And when everyone else gets a chance to be forgotten, to dissipate, to flow on or to go into the other lands or to go over to the other worlds, or you know, no gland that he ever living. It's not for him. He's he's here, and he always has been here. He built it. He stuck to it, and to me, he's just getting it done. He always will. He's the kind of character who will always just keep doing what needs to get done. Yeah, you know, and yeah. he won't ask for plaudits. He won't seek to be praised he'll just do what he has to do because that's what he's doing he's he's the kind of guy who you invite to a house party and you have a great time and you wake up the next day and the entire house has been cleaned you know the washing is all done you know everything's been tidied up wait a minute he, john that's you no? <laughs> i think you're confusing yourself that is so you i i can i can actually get i can get katie dembski bowden on the phone right now <laughs> to prove it FYI. Okay, well, no, it, it's not kind of, an ex as an example of character. <laughs> you know, he's the kind of person who, who just goes and gets things done. Yes. You know, um, because it needs doing. Yeah. Um, we have uh, Meg here in the chat and who, whose questions these are, and she made a very good point there. And he has watched all the history, the hunger and the deaths, and I feel that sadness deep. And... Yep. Yeah. Um, Kathy Hi, Meg. Says, Hi, Meg. Kathy says the work being done now, and especially the anthology, which is the Harp Club and Cauldron anthology, which I'll put links to in the chat and in the YouTube video whenever that goes out. Um, so, especially the Dagda anthology, are huge steps to opening people's eyes and hearts to Aunt Dagda again. It's his time to shine. And she also has one of you at home, um, who is Morgan, who is awesome. <laughs> as well. I've met the guy. Shook his hand. Yeah. He's a good lad. Yeah, he is a good lad. Lo good lad. Lovely to see you, Meg. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a few other questions. Um, so, Kathy's question was uh, these were from the Facebook group, so I just basically 
you know, copy paste them off. <laughs> um, so Cathy said, do you have a daily practice? And if so, how has it developed? So I think we've kind of covered that. Um, like unless there's anything else that you've kind of that you've added on or do you think that you will add something on to it or is it something that uh, you would like to develop um i think my exposure to that aspect of deity and the nature of him um it's very practical it's very very fundamental like he's he's all about doing what needs to get done and he wouldn't have a tool unless it was used you know, so I'm I'm not much for ritual. I'm I've never engaged in much of a ritual practice. I tend to, in some ways, be almost casually disrespectful of ritual at times. And you know, John, not, you're casually not out of disrespectful any... <laughs> of everything. Okay, <laughs> just <laughs> yeah. We we were actually having a a, ch a chat the other night, and Laura is a representative of pagan life rights within Ireland which is a recognized body to give legal support and legal awareness of pagans within our country, which is a huge, huge deal and took a lot of work from Laura and the rest of the committee in, involving Barbara, oh, two Barbaras. And, oh, don't and, even start naming names because you forget people. There was 13 of us in the original committee yeah. and um, we're at paganliferights.org. If anybody's interested, there's a full list of all the participants because yeah. sitting here, I would inevitably leave somebody out so please don't start naming names <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to cause a problem with that myself either. but because of the recognized status of it in our country now laura is reverend laura o'brien mm. so we were having a chat last night and you know given my circumstances and my individual and my casual disrespect well not disrespect sorry casual uh, well yeah actually the word i'm looking for is irreverence irreverence <laughs> um I, i've decided that now maybe i need to have a title so it's reverend laura o'brien and irreverent John O'Sullivan. Yay! <laughs> um, oh. But yeah, what it, what it comes down to daily practice, I don't really have a specific daily practice. Um, like awareness of self, I will eat when I need to eat and I will make sure that I'm maintaining my, my body's physical needs um, as a baseline form. And, you know, I only get to be a spiritual person if I have a physical form in which to exist. So that is part of it for me. How has it developed? I'm more willing to to take particular actions um, as and when needed. Like I'm just behind me here on the table. Actually just, what the hell? Excuse me. <laughs> Our cauldron. Yeah, well, this this is this is actually Ireland's cauldron um, that has a long and epic tale behind it involving a knight a wolf a priest and a joker um but i'll tell that tale some other time um <laughs> but yeah that, that, I'm, that's not my cauldron it's ireland's cauldron and it's it's only resting in my home um but resting i've begun to, <laughs> it's resting in my account <laughs> um, but i'm beginning to interact with it i'm beginning to kind of take it on board as maybe a bit of an action like an awareness and if i'm connecting it back to you know, the, the stories of cauldrons and the Muriasa's treasure coming out of the, that land. Um, then yeah, it, it's something that I, I work with. There's a candle lighting at the moment. And we were having like, you know, technical difficulties regarding our internet connection. I was like, you know who can fix anything? Pour him a drink, <laughs> light him a candle. You know who can fix anything. By the way, here's his drink. You know, because we decided this time I'm drinking, he's drinking, not the same thing. <laughs> he does have a, a mighty thirst on him all right mm -hmm. yeah so i don't really have a, a daily practice but i'm willing to take whatever actions within any moment or within any day that's required of me do you think you should have a daily practice john just you know out of interest do you think that you would be better served or he would be better served if you had a daily practice um the things I'm trying to do daily now is at least say his name, you know, say his name out loud so that people hear it from my voice and actually are exposed to it. Um, when it comes to service for myself, um, the practical baselines is what I'm, I'm on about really like, you know, cooking dinner for my home, you know, tending to my house and hearth, looking after my family, looking after like, you know, the, the, the baseline stuff. I'm very, very fortunate in my home, in my house here. You know, I have a beautiful hearth with a fire that can be presented and, you know, the kitchen is where you'll find me most often. Like I'm happy and delighted to cook and provide for my family. And I'm very 
fortunate in doing so. That to me is a daily practice. Any, anything is spiritual if you do it with intent. Hmm. Good answer. Okay, so um, Morgan Daimler, we love Morgan going by her books. Love Morgan. <laughs> Um, what do you do when you feel like a story that's coming through is too honest or too intense? That's a very good question. Um, and it would have to be Morgan to come up with a question like that. And she <laughs> She's a right thinker. She really is. She got right to the quick with it because I, I believe she may have read some of my stories and uh -huh. some of them get pretty intense. Um, I'm dealing with something I have never really dealt with before, which is direct attention from a deity and direct attention from a deity who's very prominent and very emotional. Um, but also who's very no fucking nonsense and practical. You know, he doesn't pull any fucking punches. Um, it's been said by some <laughs> that I'm kind of his propaganda agent, you know, that I'm, I'm re-spinning some tales and, you know, that, yeah, that's, it's the nature of things. Um, but when it comes to the stories coming through, I, honestly, Morgan, there are times where I have to stop. Um, I physically can't contain it. I physically just can't process what's coming through at that particular time. So sometimes the words just spill through and they're on the page and I get to walk away from it. Other times it blocks, it stops. And I have to go away and I have to sit and I have to consider it and I have to chew it over and then I have to rationalize it through my existence and my own perceptions in order to kind of manifest it in such a way that someone can read the words and get the message. Because I'm almost being a, a modern day translator for emotion that's thousands of years old and carrying a lot of stuff, shall we say. Um, I think it's important though when dealing with a story from this particular point of view that no punches are pulled. You know, if it's honest, it has to be honest. You know, if it's intense, it's supposed to be intense. You know, if, if I'm fortunate to be presenting these stories and if the source of these stories is exterior to myself and directly provided by him, then who am I to kind of diminish it? I, I, I wouldn't. You know, and there are parts of the stories that are most recently the Fomorian Supper, and that yeah. was that was very tough um, at particular points, and I had to kind of deal with that because of the the content. Um, I was very surprised when I was finished it how it mirrored the couple's Ford, a story I'd written months previously about like his interaction with the Morrigan at the River Runcheon. And they almost like mirror one to the other. But when it comes to him and the daughter of Vinda, it's entirely opposite. Yeah. And, you know, that was, that was something that I had to make sure that I wasn't pulling punches on. One of the other stories, um, the power of endings and beginnings, where I talk about the, how the Delta got his club, this big weapon. Um, it deals with a very very traumatic incident where Dagda's child is killed. His son Kermit is taken from him. Now, true, Kermit like, you know, got himself into a bit of a bind and it was through his actions that it happened. But then Dagda literally moved the world to find a way to bring his child back. And so dealing with that um, <laughs> led to a lot of emotion for me awareness of what it is to be a son of a father who loves that much and to be an individual who loves that much for someone I consider son. Mm. So never holding back. You know, if a story is coming true and it's supposed to be honest, it's supposed to be intense, then I'm not going to hold back. And I think a question popped up there, what do I mean by pulling punches? Like when you pull a punches, you hold back from the point of impact. And with these stories, I'm, I'm not. You know, if it's coming true and it has to be that honest, it has to be that intense, I'm not going to hold it back. Yeah, you do the work. You bear the burden. It's got to be done. Okay. So I've been, like, moved to tears at least twice during this interview. <laughs> Thanks, John. 
Oh, it's like you read this, my stories. Every time you read my stories. <laughs> all this humaning stuff. It's not good for me. Anyway, um, Myriad Atomos, Mary, um, she says, how do Dagda and Morrigan get along? Now, I'm not sure what kind of getting along she's talking about there, because I know Mary personally, and that could be anything that she needs. Well, I, I'll, I'll be honest. When I read it, um, I misread it the first time, and maybe it was Freudian tip or whatever it was. I was like, how did Adagda and Morgan get it on? Yeah. <laughs> Waggle's oh, yeah. eyebrows, suggestively. <laughs> um, but no, how did they get along? Um, it's been an interesting travel for me with that. Um, as I began to expose myself to spirituality and Irish spirituality, the first kind of deity that I acknowledged and that I interacted with on a, a personable person, person to person basis wasn't him. It was her. Um, on my father's maternal line beyond him, it's the Connor and O'Connor family. So my great granny was great granny Connor, known as the Mazzy. Um, and the O'Connors come from, funny enough, Roscommon. Funny enough, around the Cruachan area, as I was advised years later by my beloved darling Laura, when I hired her before we even knew each other as individuals or as personable friendship type peoples to take me to the Cave of the Cats. Um, I had an impression that I was called. You know, I had what's known as a come hither in an Irish sense. It's where there's a beckoning put upon you and it's a beckoning that you had best not ignore. Um, so I was called to go and see herself on her doorstep in the Cave of the Cats. And I contacted the only person I knew who could handle me on my worst day to bring me in and bring me out, should it be my worst day. And that was Laura. Um, so entertaining story. Ask me about it sometime. I'll give you the full version of it in, in real life, person, full color. But my interaction with her was something that I was very, very entertained with. <laughs> which you know, may not be a word that most people would actually use when they deal with her. Um, because she had the right to call me, but she had nothing else. And so I turned up with the honor and respect based on the come hither. I even brought her flowers. And um, I said, how are you? And she said, do you want a job? And I said, no, I'm good. And she's like, what? <laughs> Um, that's kind of the, the brief synopsis. So I then leave her company um, with this question mark hanging over me of she's like, what is this thing? And it's only months later that, you know, I'm sharing space with Laura and she's like, fine, I'll say it, Dagda, done. I'm not doing anything else. At which point when I heard the name said out loud by someone, you know, even though I'd been doing some reading and being aware of it in my time, you know, someone said the name out loud in my presence and I had a, not exactly a manifestation, just a, oh, so that's the term that applies to that presence that's been hanging slightly off to the left, standing just out of my view for the last ages. Um, so through working with him and getting an idea of how him and her interact, going back to Laura, going back to it, we, we've we got definite link to the fact that they're a couple. They're a married couple. It's, it's specifically said in the lore. And that kind of tickles me. You know, the idea that, you know, they are married. You know, it's a married relationship. Uh, but any kind of relationship really needs to be between equals. Anything that's going to last ha needs to be between equals. It doesn't have to be the same. You know, sometimes like it's, it's best that it's, it's opposites, but it needs to be equals. And so when we look at her and we look at, you know, the phantom queen, the great queen, the, you know, this, this huge embodied empowered individual for change in the entire like pantheon and our world, you know, what is her equal? What is her opposite? So that's been a huge layer of my investigation and it's still ongoing and I'm very entertained by that. But how do they get along? Yeah, they get along like a married couple. They get along like, you know, <laughs> two people who know each other inside and out, know each other's eccentricities, triggers and like charming moments. And, you know, just to me, there's an affection between them. Now, a lot of people will be like, yeah, but he has so many other children. He's had so many other relationships. And yeah, what about us? <laughs> it doesn't have to be, you know, a specific thing that, you know, you know, who's to say maybe 
she and he have children together. Like there's no rec- recording of who's the parent of a lot of the, the children who are known as children of the Dagda, you know? So it's possible that, you know, she might be a, a mother. And I know that links to the next question. Yeah, I'll be skipping ahead there. Um, oh, one but, of, <laughs> just, yeah, I, I'd say they get along very well, very affectionately. Um, but it's, it's that union of opposites, you know, mm-hmm. it's the understanding that she is his greatest nemesis as he is hers. And, you know, everything continues because they're still on the same team. Okay. And I think that people, you know, when they hear about them being a married couple, they kind of get the wrong idea because you have to, you know, you have to look back at the original Irish legal system to kind of understand what that means. Like marriages were all contractual. There were many, many different types of marriages and they were all based around contract and they weren't these kind of, you know, lifelong monogamous kind of things that we have now. Um, that's you know that's a very different worldview from when they were when they were married and there's references in the stories to you know her being his woman and him being her man um well theoretically because i have theories um i love your theories i love to talk about theories (laughs) yes but um but yeah, I think like when we when we look at when we look at them as a married couple, we have to kind of figure that in the context of the time when they were being called married and when they were being referred yeah. to as married, you know. Absolutely. Um and there's some lovely resources out there. Laura can connect them in many ways and has been a great resource to me as I'm figuring a lot of this stuff out. And one of the resources quite recently was a link to like the Imram and the Oak tree, so I can try and put my bard brain brain around the stories. Um but as I was clicking through, I was like, oh, look, there's a legal section in here. And I was like, oh, marriage. And then there's this whole big page of the multiple different types of marriage, how marriage is defined and how one makes a suit for marriage and then suits of marriage and divorce and everything that comes through. It's huge. Like, you know, the idea and the concept of the brands within the Irish tradition was vastly extensive, much more detailed and much more supportive of a, a more fluid dynamic around relationships as opposed to this you will be wed to this one person for the rest of your days. Mm. And that even like that, that would have been a medieval legal text. So um, the reference that you're making there is um, just for anybody following along at home is the Mary Jones Celtic Encyclopedia in the Ireland section. And there's a whole, uh, it's, it's divided up by, um, by different types of, of texts and different, uh, and one, there's a whole section on legal text there. So um, I can put a link to that in the notes afterwards on youtube so um yeah and like even at that as i was saying that that's the medieval like that's the the latest version Mm -hmm. of the legal text that we have you know um we don't really know what marriage would have looked like back in back in the dagdan morgan's day you know back when we're um in, in the mythological cycle you know the mythological cycle could start from as early as humans were in Ireland, which is like latest research says twelve and a half thousand years ago. Thank you, Cave and Claire. Um, yes. So you know we have butchered this, bear remains. Yeah, butchered bear remains with like tool marks on them, and um, mm-hmm. that put put the earliest humans here twelve and a half thousand years ago. So like that's fantastic. But like we don't know. Did they bring? Like I don't think that that they were calling them the Dagda and the Morrigan then. But they could have had deity that, you know developed into the Dagda and the Morrigan then and they could have been whatever version of married was then you know it, it kind of it really feels to me personally and sorry for skipping in on your interview John but um you know once the Morgan's involved I'm involved yeah um, and I love so. listening to you talk so <laughs> um but yeah it it has always felt to me that that there has been some kind of a relationship between them you know and I think that's the most that we can say you know they they get along I like the way you say that they get along like a married couple because you know we do get that but it's like one of those kind of curmudgeonly old married couples who've been married for like fucking 60 years or whatever and are just yeah are just know each other inside out and you know don't have to live Mm. but still smile every time they make the same joke (laughs) you know you're like you know you've been saying that joke for like 30 years and they're like (laughs) I know, but you still smile when I do. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, that's how I would say that they get along. Um, um, but again, it's it's even in any kind of marriage, in any kind of relationship between any two people, married or not, there's always going to be evolution. There's always going to be change. There's always going to be ups and downs. 
you know, there's going to be times where they might not talk to each other at all because they're both too fucking busy, you know? So um, I think it's a really great question and there's a lot of exploration can be done around that. But um, I would say that things seem to be very, yeah, very much married couple, um, but also balance between them. Hmm. Okay. So let's look at the the next question is uh, from Morphe um Maracatha Bodua Brigiane Brigi Okay. I need to learn how to pronounce that. Morpheus Ravenna. Um Maracatha. Yeah, no, I can get Maracatha, but go with that. Okay. <sighs> Apologies. Um I should never slag anybody else for not knowing how to pronounce Irish. But I mean, this is not my, in, in my defense, this is not my tradition. Um, this language is not in my tradition. So if you're, um, if you're willing to work in a spiritual tradition, then you should learn how to pronounce the language. Um, I know how to pronounce Marakatha. No, no I, was, I was just trying to do the rest of it. It's like Bodwa and then... Brigiana, I think it's the GI yeah, because yeah. isn't it like kind of Brigiani? Welsh as well. It's it's a baseline of Welsh coming through. No, I think it's um sure. we we should we should ask her in detail. We should ask her. Yeah. 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 You know what you should do? Get her back on for another interview. It'd be crazy. I know, right? Anyway, um who do you think is Kermit's mother? And who is Bridget's or Breach? Breach's mother. Um Interesting question, very much so. And I think a lot of this, I kind of brought up a different layer of answer than I expected because there's no way I would be able to turn around and say 100% it's this person or it's this individual within mm -hmm. the actual law or within the, the pantheon. Um, I have my own inclinations. I have my own personal feelings around it. Um, and if, those, if that's what people were looking to figure out or to ask for, I could, I could do my best to answer that. Um, but one thing that really strikes me more so is that these individuals are referred to as the Dagda's child, the children of the Dagda. Now, in other circumstances, you know, when you go through talking about the, the Celtic heroes, the Irish heroes, sorry, specifically, you know, there's always mention of their mother as well. Like there's always a very specific clear that, you know, this is Cúchulainn, son of, this is, you know, um, Conal Kernock, son of, you know, and it lists out like the mother and the father, and it's very, very clear about that. Not always. You know? Sorry to sorry to burst that little bubble there, but not always. Um, there's a couple who are notable, such as like Connor McNessa, um, mm. who would be Nessa would be his mother. Um, yeah. but when you start getting into, particularly into the um the Ulster cycle of tales, there are um there are very few actually who relate to their mother um as far as their names. But maybe in the earlier stuff, um, that would be it was more in the stuff, Like yeah. the, the matriarchal line was, you know, as equally important and as clearly like defined yeah. as part of where they come from. Um, with these individuals, like Kermit is is I never say is is epitaph if that's the right word. Like epitaph. You know, epitaph. epitaph. Yeah. Um, it's it's Minibel or Ma Mibel. Uh, Morgan will probably correct me and frowned at me in her way for not pronouncing it right um it's he's known as the quiet mouth or the small mouth in, in her translations which i really loved so you know he's known as a bit of a charming individual a charming character because kermit is the one who gets himself killed by having relationships with lou's wife lou that who was at that point high king or king of ireland um so you know, that's, it's not really an apple falling far from the tree because we know that Angus MacOg or Angus Og is born of a similar union between Dagda and Bowen. So it's not like he's not following in his father's footsteps. Um, who his mother might be, I, it would be pure speculation if to try and put any kind of name on it. Um, but the fact that the Dagda is known as being father to many, not just in the Uchi Olahar, as in, you know, like every father or many father, you know, he's actually specifically known as a father figure, um, fulfilling that role to many different individuals. Um, I don't know. It, it does come back to the idea of unions and the idea of relationships. Like it's not just you, you marry one person and you have children with that person and that is it. Um, so <laughs> thank you. 
but I yeah. also awkward question. But um, I think if I, I was to put maybe. a personal yeah. preference, a personal exactly. yes. if if I was to kind of just step into that, mm-hmm. um, I would say that Kermit is not of the same mother as Bridget. And I would say, in my personal opinion, Bridget might be a daughter of Morrigan. Ooh, controversial. Very controversial. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, I am not going to say yay or nay to that. <laughs> no, Moving swiftly. No, 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 one, no one should agree. But I think uh, it, it brings up a nice question around, and it goes back to that questioning thing that I always say is very important. Yeah. You know, don't take anyone else's word for it. Mm-hmm. Question it. Whatever even I say or whatever anyone says, question it. Mm-hmm. If you find an answer that fits with what you've been told, perfect. You have validation. You've got justification. But still, question it. Mm. You know, you might find the right answer when other people may not have actually explored it. Yeah, and I would, I would also, you know, put the the proviso in there for personal gnosis, which you know people are sick oh, did of work. talking about. <laughs> um, well, if you get, uh, if you get a you get a, a notion or a, a gnosis about something you know you have an understanding about something that you know you, you develop a theory on um, based on your experiences or based on your intuition or based on whatever um, you know I would absolutely like explore it and see if there's any evidence that can be found to see if anybody else is having these kind of notions or thoughts or experiences you know, that's the value of, of community and reaching out to community and having good, strong community links because you can kind of bounce ideas off each other and bounce experiences off each other. And that's really important and really valuable because we are trying to rebuild a practice which was, you know, yeah. taken away and taken down. Um, but at the same time, you know, there is there are too many people out there and we've all seen them. I mean, I'm, I'm going to my personal bugbear on this you know my the, the horrific fucking example i always use i'm cursing a lot i'm sorry um the example i always use is you know this this woman who came into one of the groups and, and started going on about how Maeve and the morrigan were enemies because she you know she had come to ireland and she because obviously she wasn't from ireland um but she had come to Ireland and she had she had come for Maeve, I think, and then she hadn't been able to set foot on any Morrigan sites or vice versa. I'm not even sure. I kind of switched off to the details. But um, but like whatever her personal experience had been, you know, there is nothing in the literature to support that. There's nothing in anybody else's experience that I've ever come across to support that. And certainly in my own personal experience, I, t- I did take that very personally because while I don't... Um, I don't have a devotional practice with Maeve. I have a very good working relationship with Maeve. I was guardian at Maeve's site for a hell of a long time. Um, and, you know, that's obviously always also the Morrigan's sites um, through the cave uh, of the cats that you mentioned earlier, uh, Oinagat in English. I have a harder time saying it in English than I do in Irish. Um, but... Yeah, so like it, it just was so outside and like it wasn't just me. I know I had a very personal reaction to it, and um, which I'm totally owning, but it wasn't just me. There was a lot of people that reacted very, very strongly to that because there was just no foundation. But like it wasn't even that this woman was coming in and relaying her personal experience because that's fine. But what she was doing was coming in and saying like, I have found the the true way and, you know, this is... um this is the only way like that, uh, that there is to be. So hang on, my co-presenter has just uh, muted himself. I just need to unmute him. Sorry. One sec. Unmute. Here we go. Have we got you? Are we back? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, no, you're absolutely spot on, Laura. And I think, you know, what I would say is that, you know, you have to be willing to explore and you have to take on board. But the first person that you should question is always yourself. Mm. You know, if you have experienced something, you know, you have to begin by, am I right? Am I fucking right or am I wrong? You know, mm. what can I do to support this, to justify it? And when you approach it, it should be approached as a question. Mm. Has anyone else experienced this? Mm. Yeah. You know, and that's the only way to develop like as a, a spiritual community um, and to explore it and, and kind of grow these kind of awarenesses together. Hmm. Um, 
by the way, just in, in other news, I'm thinking of renaming this series of interviews as Randy Mac Rant Pants Rants. <laughs> yeah, because I keep going off. Welcome to one hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> I am, I'm going to, no, actually, I'm not even going to apologize because no. fuck, fuck the world. Um, so there's another question here, moving swiftly on again. Um, there's another question here that's uh, uh, from Morpheus again. Um, mm. Maro Katha, is there anything devotees should know about that offends the Dagda? That's an interesting question. Um, it is an interesting question, and it's not one that I had considered or explored a lot with him because all of my approaches to him have been very organic, very kind of like flowing like you know he comes to me to have a chat or I go to him to have a chat and you know we explore kind of topics together whatever way it's supposed to be brought forward mm. um to kind of bring up the idea of is there anything devotees should know that offends the like the like the it's the first time I'd even consider it to be honest um breaking down who and what he is he's very forgiving he's very patient you know he's known as a father like you know a father to many and the father is going to have a lot of patience for all of his kids to kind of figure shit out and to give them time to learn their lessons and grow um so he's not going to take offense easy but he is going to have his baselines and you know this is one of those areas where i don't know if it's me or i don't know if this is specifically personal gnosis but what i really came up with um oddly enough, this morning in the shower as I was having, you know, quiet cleansing time was making a promise that you know you can't keep. Hmm. Wow, yeah, because that's parenting. That's cardinal rule, cardinal sin number one in parenting. Well, see, the thing is, though, like, don't make a promise if you can't keep it. Like, he's... He... He has no problem with people understanding the limitations. He probably understands limitations more than anyone would, you know, and he's very accepting of it. He's very happy and comfortable with the fact that, you know, we're all messy little human creatures on some level and we all have to figure our shit out and kind of carry on. Like, and even for a promise, like promises change as people grow and change, you know? So it's not a matter of, you know, if you make a promise and like, oh, and then your circumstances change. Oh, no, I can't break the promise. It's not even that. He's very understanding and very acceptable of it. But if you go in to give your word, if you give your oath on something, knowing that you can't fulfill, that would be a problem. It's not lying. It's, it's not about, oh, you told a lie because everyone tells lies. There's white lies. You know, he tells grand fucking stories all the time himself, which may or not be considered like, you know, 100% factual or not. It's not about that. It's actually about when you commit yourself to something, when you give a promise. A false you oath. To to that, you know, um, and it, it's kind of, it's being as good as your word. And so, like, I won't promise at, at all unless I can 100% fulfill that promise. And I think that's something that really connects over to him as well. Like, he will be very happy to adjust expectations, very happy to give you as much time as you fucking need to sort your shit out or to change your scenario or for the growth to happen for you to fulfill what or what you have given. But do not go into it with the, like, hidden intent of not fulfilling it because he'll take your promise and wait for you to break it. And the moment that you do that... <laughs> I've yet to be on his bad side <laughs> and it's someone I, I know I don't ever want to be on their bad side yeah that was a very yeah. ominous noise there John. <laughs> it sounded like a, a cross <laughs> between somebody's throat getting slit and their bones getting broken which I suppose is appropriate but, um, so, I don't know for sure like, to me yeah. he's, he's he's very approachable he's very happy like you know he is that larger than life boisterous charming entertaining cuddly kind of character who will do anything for you and support you in your existence but he is power. He's known for power. Like when he get, when he gets his club, he gives, you know, the the, the one of the, the sons who he takes the club from. They're like, okay, well, what guarantee can you give us that like, you're going to give the club back eventually? And he's like, um, yeah, I promise by like you know the sun and the moon and the tides. Hmm. And they're like, what what you mean like by the weather? And he's like, no, no, I control all of that shit, so I promise by that. Hmm. So. Yeah, you know, it's very are... interesting to explore. But that personally, again, be a personal nonsense or me, um, that that's one thing I would say he would not have any truck for. Hmm. Interesting. So false oaths. 
Um, just to, to clarify there, just in case anybody's not familiar, um, it wasn't one of his sons that he was talking about that he took the club off. Um, it was uh, one of the three brothers that he took the club from. Yeah, um, the three brothers he met off in the lands of the East. Mm -hmm. The whole story about that on John's blog, links <laughs> are below. Um, yeah. So next question was Danielle. Now, I think you've slightly covered this, but you know what? Um, I'm going to give my side of this story because um, you kind of, you made a brief referral there to like, oh, fine, I'll say his name. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give the other half of that story, if you like. Um, Please do. Yeah. I love so, a good story. <laughs> well, just briefly. Um, you're not here to hear me storytelling. Um, but just briefly, when we, you know, we'd been together over a year and... I would have been surprised when you asked to go to the Morrigan's Cave. Well, not really surprised because I kind of figured she was telling me that you owed her time. So um, I wasn't really surprised that you wanted to go to the cave. Um, I, I didn't really know what was going on there and I was kind of staying out of it uh, because, as you said, we didn't really know each other at the time. Um, but after that, when we did start getting to know each other, I did, I did have a very big sense of of himself around you you know and I was like well you know this is John's path to walk and even after we get into a relationship and all that kind of stuff was going on that actually made me more kind of loath to get involved in it because it really you know I didn't want to be I didn't want to be causing anything that was going to happen to you you know or, or be kind of instrumental in it like it really had to be kind of your path to walk you know your journey so all of that was going on for kind of a year, a year and a half. And, you know, John, for anybody who's not personally familiar with Anshkeli Bjog here, um, he's the most fucking stubborn of men, I, of, of people, never mind men, um, super stubborn. And like, we'll just kind of deliberately obtuse, he calls it, you know, where he just won't recognize and won't register he just puts the blinkers on and that's it you know he he just I don't have to deal with that that's fine and you know and I'm not saying that in a negative way because it's actually it's it's fantastic like it's, it's I'm, I'm jealous of it in a lot of contexts but when it came to this it was very frustrating <laughs> because um not so much because I was frustrated because you can take as fucking long as you want to to do your journey as far as I'm concerned but what I was concerned about was I was starting to sense the Dagda's frustration because the Dagda had been waiting for a very fucking long time. Like since very early, since like a year, two years, whatever. And longer, probably. Longer, whatever, past lives. I don't even know what the hell is going on there is between you and him. But yeah. yeah, but what I did get was this frustration this growing frustration while you know he was kind of standing in the corner and like picking his nails and trying not to tap his feet and trying not to be a bother and you know he was kind of he was there and he couldn't really go away or didn't want to go away but he also didn't want to be a pain because he knew I was aware of him and he was aware of me and first polite very polite very very polite and so all of that was going on and I was just getting more and more concerned because this big fucker of a god was in our bedroom, you know, a lot of the time, and <laughs> was making me a little bit uncomfortable, I must admit. Um, Not during inappropriate times, because there was no, no consent for his lecture. No, 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 there was no. Um, and he, he is a bit of a perv, um, and he oh, totally yeah. would have been there if, if he had been led. Yeah, but, you know, we, we did come to an, a, a, an arrangement, you know, in that, like, there are certain times and places where it's appropriate and not appropriate. But, you know, he wasn't going away and it was very obvious that he wasn't going away. And you were just in that fucking tunnel vision. And well, that day, well, just, I'm nearly finished, nearly finished now, mister. Um, that day, I had literally been lying there, you know, in the bed. It was like a Sunday morning or something, whatever it was, you know, and just a, a relaxed, lazy day. And I'm lying there in the bed and, you know, he's beside me playing video games or whatever the hell he was doing. and. <laughs> Like, it was almost like I could hear the feckin' club rattling around over in the corner of the room. And eventually, the Dagda turned around to me and said, okay, fine, can you just do me a favor? And I was like, I told you I didn't want to get involved. And he's like, could you just do me a favor? He listened to you. Could you just say my name? And I was like, 
is there anything else involved in this contract? And he's like, no. And he says, I'm sorry to bother you. I don't mean to intrude. I don't, and he was very, he was fierce polite now, in fairness, fierce polite. Um, and actually a little bit mortified and a little bit pissed off yep. that it had come to that, you know? Yep. It was like he couldn't kind of manage his own stuff. Um, and eventually, like, I was like, it was like, it just exploded out of me. It was like, oh, fine. I get to say his name. The Dagda. Now that's done. It's up to you. So there you go. <laughs> that was the first connection. The first contact. I, 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 I love your retelling of the story. Thank yeah. you, darling. Um, I have a particular process around my personal spirituality and, you know, my personal awareness of things in that you need to acknowledge yourself, your free will, your choice in everything. And it's important that whatever you agree to, you agree to willfully because that's the only way it's going to be a healthy balance. Like if you go into a, a willful contract with deity and you're like, listen, whatever you say I'll do fine, you know, but it has to be willfully. It has to be by your choice. And the acknowledgement that my choice is extremely valid is still important to me because it means that no matter what work I have to do for deity or for a community or for anything, I'm allowed to have a part of it that it's my choice. I choose this, which allows me to accept responsibility for whatever I do in that job. You know, someone who says, oh, well, no, my God made me do it. Flippantly pushing responsibility away from them to their deity okay, you know, if that's your agreement with the deity that they take responsibility for all of your actions, sure, fine. It's not how I roll. For me, it's, it's got to be about my choice, me in every moment, because I'm the only me that I have, irrespective of what deity I'm working for. Yeah. So that's a huge part of <laughs> what I am. Um, and I was aware, very much aware of it. Like as soon as I met a Morrigan priestess or priest, sorry, correcting myself. As soon as I met a Morrigan devotee and priest, I was like, okay. And I was very much aware of that after that point, you know, cause I read, you know, if I'm going to be moving into a relationship with, you know, this powerful, beautiful woman who has contractual obligations to uh, an ancestor deity of the Irish people, I need to know what I'm aware of here and of course given that I got to come hither from herself to go meet her before our relationship ever started Laura I did my reading on her and you can't really read about her without getting a link that goes to him and so I was aware of his existence and um, but I need to kind of move it to a space where we were willing to kind of connect and have a chat with each other and I was willing to accept not just the interaction and the connection but also the responsibility of the choices that follow from there. Mm. Um, I'm a very serious person when it comes to certain things because, you know, I'm the only version of me I can ever have and I want it to be the best version it can be. Um, and a big part of that is responsibility. Yeah. And um, I suppose that comes back to, you know, not breaking your oath. If you're going to step into this, if you're going to make a promise, then you do it in your own time, you know, and mm -hmm. like, consider yeah. And as frustrating as it was, like I, you know, like I said, I didn't, I, I know how that. long you're going to take in your own journey is totally up to you. Um, there was just, there was other considerations for me personally. Um, I know. So, <laughs> so I'm, anyway. I'm sorry you got put in that position. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think it was, I don't know, like, um, it, uh, it, yeah, it happened the way it's supposed to happen as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and it probably set some of the parameters for our, our relationship between me and him. Um, because just because someone turns up knocking on the door doesn't mean they automatically get to come through, sit down and take over the show. Mm. You know? Um, yeah. But now, now we have a comfortable space, two armchairs beside each other. And, you know, I write stories and he drinks tea and tells me them. Mm. Yeah, and I think, you know, like looking back, it definitely did happen in the time, like for you, it def in my in my opinion, it definitely did happen in, in the time frame that it was supposed to and when you were ready for it to happen. So like it's, you know, it's no harm, no foul. And um, yeah. I think he was just, as I said, I think he was just getting frustrated Frustrate. because he'd been waiting so long for it. <laughs> so long. Yeah, and his, well, if, if, you read that story, if you read that story, <laughs> All Life is Stories, the one with him going into the hospital. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, the person at the end of it is someone I'm very familiar with. Mm. In my opinion. Yes. In my story. Mm-hmm. But then again, it's all fiction. Yeah, none of us are weak-minded, so don't be doing those. I know. I I, on us. See, that's why it's a joke. I know you're not weak-minded. <laughs> anyway, so anyway. thank you for answering that one, Laura. Yeah. Um, Kathy says, yeah, when you're not being dragged into caves, you're being dumped in the sea and poked for help. <laughs> Priestessing is fun. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just for reference, I don't mind being called priestess or priest because I would identify as gender fluid. So it could be either or in any day. So I don't take offense whether I'm priestess or priest. Um, on any given day, I'm not, uh, I'm not hung up on, on gender terms, but I do like the awareness around it because um, yes. obviously that's important because it is very important to a lot of people. So um, just because it's, it's personally okay for me, um, it is worth checking um, how somebody would prefer to be identified. Just as a side note, side note. But also like, you know, falling to a default presumptiveness of, you know, because of your gender, then you default to priestess is something that I have to wire around in my brain to make sure I'm aware of not not taking what I have always been presented with, that I'm actually making considered decisions for my language because mm. language impacts how we interact with our world. Okay, point of note, not because of my gender, because of my genitals, um, you're defaulting to priestess. My gender is a different thing. Uh, sexuality <laughs> and sex organs and gender are all... Uh, two different things. things. Yeah, well, yeah. three different things, but yes. Um, so... You, I'm learning. <laughs> I, know you are. I know you are, and I'm not correcting you specifically i'm just you know for for a point of note i know you are aware but the the language is so ingrained in us and the, yeah. the presumption is so ingrained on in us you know but it's it's worth just mm-hmm. kind of calling it out a little bit and just being very very clear around these things because it, it costs us nothing you know and there are people who it's very very important to so Absolutely. yes um anyway now where were we uh so we had danielle's question which we've just answered I we, think. Can, we can skip the next one we, we do <laughs> next one the next, <laughs> the next one, <laughs> next one is you, orla. orla my friend orla um, who was at dinner the other evening when um when john came up with his irreverent <laughs> <laughs> title his new his new title yeah um, irreverent john o'sullivan it's great yeah. uh, it could be a thing i'm totally gonna get t-shirts printed yeah Hashtag irreverent you're, it's for your business card um yes. So she does, um, she does say, what is the Dagda like after dark? And this is a, a very funny reference to um, a kind of a running joke, but also not a joke because it's a real thing. Um, Dagda after dark is uh, one of the rewards on John's Patreon, um, which I will put in the, the notes um, so everybody can go and support him and his fantastic stories. And you get an audio mm-hmm. version of his stories as well, which are amazing. Um, if I do say so myself, I do, I do love his voice, but I know I'm not the only one. Um, so we will go to patreon.com forward slash Dagda. And when you go there, you will see a reward option that says Dagda after dark. So I, I can't even say that in a sexy voice. It's supposed to be read in a very sexy voice. And I just, you know, I don't have the, I just don't have the, I, I don't even I can't I can't okay. even um, this is a very entertaining question and challenging question all at once um, if I was to give probably a default honest answer I'd say Dagda After Dark is like Dagda any time of anywhere busy <laughs> um, <laughs> No, so much so that you you might like lift lift the the spiritual phone and be like, hey, yeah, Dagda, I need to stop. no no vo- voicemail. Uh, yeah, no, get back to me when you, you get the message. Cheers, thanks. Um, I've even spoken to other like Dagda people out there as well. Um, a friend of mine, Scott, over in California, and you know he checked in with me. He's like, is is it normal that like you know you try and reach out in prayer and then he just doesn't answer? And I'm like, yeah, he's just busy. He's just elsewhere. It's fine. Um. Dagda so after dark. Is he, is he is he busy or is he busy? <laughs> is he busy? busy. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting thing to come through and a diff- interesting kind of conversation to have. Um, oh, look at because, you squirm! Look at you squirm! So funny. A little bit. <laughs> Thanks, Orla. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, you can't tell in this light, but I am going slightly bright red. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say that Dagda. 
I, I actually coined the term as a, a joke, to be honest. Um, we were over in California sitting at a table post PantheaCon and, you know, we're coming up with hashtags, random hashtags, which were very entertaining, sitting with Morgan Daimler and Melody at a table, like, you know, sharing a casual social beverage, um, which, you know, to me is, is like the devotional, like anywhere people gather, share a social, ve- so, social beverage, share a story and mention Dagda, it's devotional. Um, and I'm going with like, you know, hashtag, you know, Dagda does the work, you know, hashtag Dems Dagda rules. And then out of nowhere, I was like, hashtag Dagda after dark, you know, at which point it was like, mm, what's that? I'm like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when it came to the pantry and, uh, and breaking down the ideas of things, um, I, I put it in, like this idea of dying to have the dark. Um, I think what my intent, my original intent was that after dark, people tend to be a different type of themselves. Um, probably being a bit more serious than what was intended for the, the joke of it all. When the, when the sun is up, when we're busy, when we're out in the world, when we're interacting with other people, you know, we're a different persona. We're like, you know, the persona who fits in with our occupation, our family, our friends, whatever it is. But after dark, you know, when we are at home alone in the dark, that's when you are a lot more you. And my concept of, Dagda after dark is when you are a lot more you and you get to just sit in some in company of someone who accepts every part of you. Um, from the Patreon rewards, my intent, of course, is to you know provide time. You know, so if someone actually wanted to connect at that level to arrange for a time where we just sit and just shoot the breeze, ask the questions, interact, you know, see what we can learn together on things, um, and get support from someone who's, you know, working through a lot of stuff, Dag the Style, as it would be, hashtag Dag the Style. Um, that to me is Dag After Dark. You know, it's not it's not all sex and triple X kind of stuff, which, you know, we can definitely talk about because he is known in the Irish pantheon as, you know, large appetites, including sexual appetites, but also, you know, fertility. You know, when we talk about the children of the Dag, there's a lot of them. <laughs> um so I think when it comes to what is Dag the Light After Dark, it's probably someone who's willing to sit with you in whatever darkness you happen to be in and be there for whatever aspect of what you need. I'm reminded of the story that you wrote, um, which the name has escaped me, unfortunately, um, where he is down in the dark under the tree. And mm-hmm. um, do you want to talk about that? Because that is actually, I mean, I know we started this very uh, on a very funny note, but... But you do make a, a very interesting point, and I think that story is very representative of it. So, do you want to? Yeah. Do you know the name of it? Um, I believe it's called "The Darkness Within." Mm. Um, it's funny enough. It's actually a story about Dagda and the Morgan. It's about the relationship that they have, um, and when you're dealing with this large, larger-than-life character who's always there for everyone, always there for the balance, always there to do the work who puts himself out time and again, like when you go back to the lore on us, you know, the Fomorian Supper, he physically sacrifices every aspect of his being to prevent a war. Mm. Sacrifices his pride by going to it. Sacrifices his physical form by eating what's been presented to him, which is a horrific challenge. He then sacrifices his physical, like, you know, his pride, you know, by having, you know, the, the carry of being a, a pony, a jockey. His horse, dignity, or, yeah. His dignity. His, pride, his dignity is sacrificed there because she demands he carry her on his back. At the end of which she demands sex and he sacrifices his form again. So when we deal with reciprocity and we deal with the balance of things, you know, anyone can only take so much. And the thing that really strikes me about him is that on his on every day you'll see him, on every day he'll be there when he is not fit to be around people you won't even know he's gone you know he just he will have to go take care of business which is his business at that point and so i was exploring the story of what it would be like in a darkness 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 you know what are you actually going to deal with what are you going to be presented by um and it's it's an interesting tale about 
and the, the angle I took it from was actually through their relationship. To go back to, you know, Myriad's kind of talk there, it's the relationship between the Morgan and the doctor. Like, you know, on his worst day, the only person who could handle him is her. And she comes and she finds him in the darkness. And she finds him underneath the tree. And what she's presented with is him without any social operating system. Him without any sense of humanity. Because he had to sacrifice it. He gave it all up. You know, the anger is too large. You know, it's, it's too great in him. And so he's dealing with it the only way he can at that point by going deep within the earth and beating it out. You know, the earth can absorb it. The earth can take it. Unfortunately, he can fucking give it. And so it's an interaction with this darkness, the darkness that exists within all of us and a darkness that exists all around us. Um, so many people are afraid of the dark and it's understandable. But part of it might be because in the darkness, in your own darkness, there's no one there but you. And you have to be honest. You know you're lying to yourself when you are the only person in the room. And you tell, tell like, you know, uh, it probably goes into deeper psychology. I could probably ramble off on this topic for ages and I really don't want to go take it up every time. But to me, Dark to After Dark is that interaction of in your darkness, in your worst of moments, you know, who's going to be there. Mm. And I have found that he is there for me. Mm. I'd recommend go read the story. It's called the darkness within. Um, I could read all of the story. Well, actually I will. I'm, I am going to be reading all the stories. If you want to hear me read the story, sign up for the Patreon. <laughs> or, um, or let me know if you really need it and I'll send it to you. I don't mind. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. No, like, yeah, thank you for that. Um, but he's great at sex and he has a massive cock. <laughs> <laughs> to bring it back to that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, okay. Okay. You. Thank you, Orla. Um, Morgan Daimler has another question. Uh, what has surprised you most about your work with the Dagda? Um, how much of it I was doing before I even knew his name? <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the when you get this idea, this information about a particular deity and you begin to figure it out, you know, you're looking for this big thing, you know, especially with this big character. You're looking for, you know, what are these huge earth moving kind of re like truths? Because, you know, literally one of the stories is, you know, Bress kind of abuses Dagda to make him build a fucking fort, mm. you know? And he does it. And that's kind of one of the things that leads to the whole Fomorian War because, like, there's no reciprocity. Again, back to Meg. Thanks. Um, what surprised me was that it wasn't as big as I thought it would be or should be. Mm. Um, it's not about the big things. It's about the small things. It's about the day-to-day. -day. You know, he's strikes me as so remarkably in tune with what humanity is, with what our physical form requires. You know, you need your sleep, you need water, you need food. You know, these are all the baselines. You need companionship. We need community around us. We need to interact with other people to share the scales, share the story. You know, that was what surprised me most. That instead of the priority being on, you know, this, I am the all at her of like, you know, chieftain of the the gods, whatever. Nah, he, he doesn't go in for the big show and the big, thing. he will, you know. Yeah, he's but that him too. About, yeah. It's him about turning up and being like, you know what, just just tell me a story and make me a fucking sandwich. <laughs> and that's, that's, I think, what surprised me most about it. Yeah. Okay. Um... Oh, sugar, hang on. Um, your sister, Janice. Um, <laughs> I love you, sister. <laughs> okay. So Janice says, how many children does the Dagda have? And tell us about your current tattoos and the next one. Interesting question. Both um, 
I'll take the first part at a slightly oblique angle because I'm awkward and, you know, contrary that way. <laughs> um, he's a father figure. You know, when you break that down, father to many, father to many doesn't mean that, you know, he had sex and like, you know, created a lot of progeny by his biological inf- interactions. It could also mean that he's the father figure. He's the person that, you know, fits the role of father within their society, within their like process. So um, how many children does the dad have? As many as want to call him father. Hmm. So like biologically speaking, there's a lot. <laughs> like you got Bridget, you got Kermit, you got Angus Oak, which are all the main ones. But there's also the other three brothers as well who take over as the, the kings of Ireland after Dag that kind of passes beyond they're, that. They're so, his grandchildren. Like, his grandchildren that mm. come from that. So there's, there's like, again, I don't have the academia. I'm still kind of learning some of that kind of stuff and I'm digging around in it. Mm. But I think again to take it back to the angle he's the one who fulfills that role of father um even if it's without biology yeah i like your first answer i have to say um for anybody who does want to look at the academia um morgan daimler that we've been talking about she has a book on the dagda which we don't have a print copy of yet oh it's not out yet um not released yet it's not released yet uh, it will be coming out very very short some of us have seen it it's amazing yeah. <laughs> i haven't kind of gotten her back with a full review because i'm like you know processing is like oh. um, yeah. but yeah I, I definitely yeah morgan's just fantastic just, yeah. just all of morgan yes by all morgan's books um so tell us about your current tattoos and the next one hang on hang on i have props, I have props. <laughs> there's wait, props wait for it okay wait that's your first tattoo right there oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. this, this, is, this is a picture of my first Dagda, tattoo Dagda after dark. you better say yeah, which, which part of your body this is on because it looks <laughs> it looks it looks quite strange this is right 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 there that that's where it is that's right here on my sternum um uh, which hurt hang on up. hang on um the screen was still on me so people didn't see it so you're gonna have to do that again no i i don't oh, okay, do it fine. again there no down here no can't see it oh well you get the live show every day laura it's fine you need to um, be talking so that the screen flips to you oh okay then... so i have to specifically be talking was talking so that it, you know picks up that this is my chest this is my sternum you know this is where i got cut and tattooed right onto the, the breastbone of my body good job that worked that time that worked good job good job <laughs> okay you're great. welcome world now you have seen more of me charming great um the whole purpose of where i actually got that done the choice of that tattoo was because it was something that is on my chest that you know it's not there for public consumption it's it's right in the middle of my body and it's something that i see when i look in the mirror every morning when i get out of my showers um it's also something that goes like you know in front of me or it's before me um into the world um, as you go through, like uh, talking about tattoos, to me, tattoos are art, absolutely, but specifically for connecting to me, um, it's it's a representation of a, a, a belief or a physical form or a manifestation of a, an, an ideology that I want to be branded with for the rest of my life. Um, this was the first one that I got done. Um, I did a lot of research on it. If I'm going to wear it forever, then it's going to mean something to me. What you're looking at on the left and right of the main symbol is the alpha and the omega, which is the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. Um, it's also representation of the idea of divinity because it's the beginning and the end. You know, it's everything encompassed between the beginning and the end. Um, so that's kind of where I, I wanted to go with that ideology. The middle part is a com- combination of Norse runes because I was doing a lot of rune work at that particular early time. The first top part is horribly pronounced, uh, Wunyo, um, it's the rune for joy. The bottom part is the rune for gifts or bonds or relationships. And um, combined in such a way, it's referred to colloquially as the love bind rune um, for partnerships and for bonding. Um, but to me, what it really represented was a combination of joy in your connections, joy in your bonds. 
you know, um, joy in those things that you, you are bound to and connected to in the rest of the world. Um, and so when you put all together between the beginning and the end, you know, of your life or of your story, you really should be focusing on having joy within your bonds or within your connections. Mm-hmm. Um, additional layers that were kind of built into it as well. The, the P and the X symbol were historically adopted as the Chi Ro, which is a, again, the, G, the Greek spelling of the word Christ back when I was a, you know, more of a, in line with the Christianity, not Catholicism, Christianity of it. Um, the symbolism of Christ and what kind, that kind of represented, but also historically speaking, was adopted by Constantine, the emperor of the Holy Roman Emperor, as a, a military symbol. So that any kind of Roman legionary or army marching out under the symbol of Christ could not be beaten. And from a psychological propaganda point of view, it was great because the Romans did hockey the heck out of Owen, but I think it was more you know military prowess. But we can talk about that another time. So this to me, tattoo to go back to the the root kind of main meaning of it is that in all of our lives for each and every one of us between the beginning and the end of the day between the beginning and the end of the week the week the month the year your life you know take joy in your partnerships take joy in your bonds take joy in the things that connect you to your life and to other people um because to be honest like you know why why live a life without joy oh i love being bonded to you yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> this being... <laughs> Moving swiftly on. <laughs> Laura, we have people watching. I know, right? <laughs> Decked after dark. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. This piece was something that happened um, kind of organically after my discovery of Dagda. Um, it's something that I kind of doodled on a post-it note while I was in work in the employable days um, of eBay and I was just again exploring the ideas of the stories exploring the ideas of like you know the magical artifacts that were attributed to Dagda and they kind of just merged together into this one kind of shape um, but then as I began to look at the the artifacts themselves and explore them through story it began to layer in extra meaning which I'm always delighted to find whenever you get something on your skin forever. Here it is on my wrist. So the location is crucially important because it's on my wrist connected to my hand. Um, the first section of it, the main outline body is the cauldron. You know, one of the chief treasures of the two of the Danon, it's brought from Morris and it's the cauldron of, well, you know, satisfaction maybe. <laughs> um, because no company would go away unsatisfied. Now to me, that represents hospitality. It's the idea of the giving. It's the fact that, like, you know, when people come to your house, they come to your home, you give, you feed them, you know. But the cauldron began to layer into more because, you know, it says specifically that the cauldron, no one, no company would go away unsatisfied. Satisfaction isn't always about food, <laughs> being well fed, you know. Satisfaction would also be about sharing a hearth, sharing warmth, sharing companionship, sharing community, sharing wisdom. You know, so it began to gain more layers as I began to look into it more. And so the location of it upon my wrist pointing out towards my hand uh, with the open end of it pointing towards my hand is to encourage me to give, to remind me to, to give of the hospitality um, in all of those different various aspects. Um, the next part I would touch on is the harp. Uh, again, another magical artifact known that the Dagda could play tunes upon the harp to cause people to revel, to joy, to dance. It would cause people to cry, to grieve, to mourn. Another song that he played would actually cause people to sleep, to sleep and to rest. And when they'd wake, they would be restored and refreshed. Um, the magic of the harp actually led to the name of the blog, the, the third string is what it's called. Um, because this to me is about feeling. It's about motion. You know, when, you, when you're feeling joyful, revel. Absolutely, don't hold back. You know, if you're feeling sad or like down, allow yourself to feel your feelings. You know, F- allow your emotions to be part of your existence and then sleep. Sleep and rest. And, you know, after you've had an emotional revel of dancing or an emotional like period of like mourning or crying, your sleep after that will be the most restorative you will have. Um, it began to 
mean a lot more to me when I, I got it there because it's to remind me to acknowledge my emotions. Um, my relationship with my emotions is fraught. A way it's a challenge. Um, because, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm an emotional character. I have to manage that very carefully to make sure that I'm maintaining that as healthily as possible. But I'm also a product of my society where males are told that, you know, to cry is weak. To mourn or to kind of like, you know, be afraid is not manly. Man up. Don't feel your feelings. Don't express emotion because therefore you're weak. So it's a difficult circumstance and it's important to acknowledge that you have to feel your feelings. They're part of you for a reason. So that's where I go with that element of it. Um, it also reminds me of the high rate of suicide that happen in my country amongst young adolescent males um, because of that circumstance where you're told not to feel your feelings. Boys don't cry. Me bollocks. Boys should fucking cry. If you've got to cry, cry. Everyone's feelings are valid. That's why they exist. So that's where I go with the harp. That's what the harp means to me. Um, the Triskelion, which is the spiral down the bottom, is part of the ways. Um, it's a symbol most commonly seen in New Grange. You can actually see the one that's you know famously carved in there um, across the stones, the curb stones and capstones outside as well. Uh, very, very famous for these symbols. Of course, the understanding of it is lost to the, the mists of history and time. Um, but what it means to me, it's it's the pathways of kind of life and spirit. You know, it's how it actually goes around it's how we kind of flow from mind body spirit all into this one existence this one kind of shape and it's also representational to me of the path that we walk you know we all have to walk this spiral of physicality so we can understand our physical nature this spiral of mentality so we can understand our own minds and then the spiral of spirituality so we can begin to figure out how it connects with us more and you know what layers of our existence are built into that um so that's why that symbol is part of it for me and the last is of course the club um one end would kill the rough end would end people's lives and the smooth end would bring them back from the dead that to me really is heavy because what you're talking about there is someone carrying the power of life and death someone being responsible for choosing life and death. Who's going to do that? Who's going to have the ability to actually walk around every day deciding who lives and who dies and accepting responsibility for that? And that's what that club becomes to me. That's what that club means to me, responsibility. It's standing for what you do in your existence defines who you are to a certain degree, but you're responsible for it. You know, if you make a choice, you take the consequences. If you have the power, I won't go Spider-Man with it, with great power comes great responsibility. But if you, have, if you have that power, then you need to make sure that you're using it in a responsible way. And that's power in any way. Like knowledge is power, you know? Emotional communications, interactions, positions of authority, all of this is power. And if you're not kind of providing the responsible control for that, if you're not accepting the fact that you are responsible, you are ultimately responsible for the power of your existence, then you're not doing right by other people. Yeah. So all of that is what sits upon my wrist from my left arm to present it into my left hand out into the world. People will, you know, and have said, you know, there's more to understandings of the left and the right hand, the left hand being the giving hand, the right hand being the receiving hand. I don't know. I'm just left-handed. I write with my left hand. <laughs> you know, I'm a salespaw. I'm a kid hog. That's how I write. Um, and that is my existence. As for my next tattoo, um, there is a currently existing no plans for my next tattoo. Um, there's a lot of retail space upon my skin. That last tattoo was actually done by the, the beautifully talented and amazing Morpheus Ravana um, on, funny enough, on her weekend over here in Ireland. Like, you know, she was heading over to Wales and I was like, since you're here. And uh, 
yeah, I, I had no intent to get it. Um, but then I thought, if I'm going to trust anyone with my skin and with my blood to put a spiritual mark or brand upon my flesh, I can trust her. And um, seems like you haven't mentioned it, there was a certain rite of passage that came with that tattoo as well, um, where you had to you had to step into accepting the responsibility speaking of responsibilities accepting yeah. the responsibility of the title of priest of the dagda because you were being you were doing the work and you were being thought of in that way and you were being mm. um related to in that way so uh, it was it was time it was past time for you to to step into that so do you want to just kind of quickly i know by the way you're all fucking heroes who are still here all like two hours later um well done <laughs> well and I know, I know. And I know a lot of people will watch this on playback and they'll be pausing and, you know, listening to bits of it in, in fits and starts. And that's fine. But like... Mm. If anyone makes it this far, oh, you know, heroes. I'm shocked and surprised, but you're heroes. always amazing. Heroes. And yes. I love the company. Yes. But anyway, not um, to sideline what we were talking about because it's important. Um, stepping into mm. your priesthood, that's, that, that, was, uh, that was what that yeah. tattoo kind of represented when you got it. It was. It was. Um, the word priest in Ireland is fraught with layers and nuance, not all of which are very positive. When you have what Laura refers to as a criminal organization who are represented and embodied on a day-to-day -day basis by their clergy or this individual called priest in every community in every country, well, in every con community and county and township and parish within our island. Um, again, it's a great position of power. Now, I've known some absolutely fantastic individuals. I really, really have of, you know, Franciscan, Dominican, different exposures, like, you know, different priests. You know, I've, I've, I've met some really great individuals who are spiritual leaders, spiritual guides. They're people who are actively living their faith and practicing it in such a way as to support and grow and encourage and nurture the needs of their community. That is their focus, and they are 100% doing it right. Hmm. But, but I could probably count on my hand how many of them there are. Mm. And when you're dealing with what's widely known, clearly known, and factually kind of recognized as systematic abuse of power of people within our country by these individuals, it's a problem. Mm. It's a very serious problem. And so when you said the word priest in Ireland, it's layered with so much of that, that, you know, for me, my thought processes on it was a very uncomfortable response. You know, I'd stepped away from the, the, the specific Catholic church because of that reason, because of the abuse of power. You know, I would say that there's elements of Christianity that, you know, the fundamentals, the baseline stuff, not like fundamental Christian nature, but the, the intent. Hmm. the idea you know love one another you know that's that, that's fantastic you know but as soon as you start getting down into the the dogma and the doctrine of like yeah but like not because of this and because of that and don't eat like pigs and whatever it's like really you know you're just building rules for the sake of having rules um but the idea of priest was a difficult one for me because of what it had connected to within my country and because of the damage that had been done by that organization within my country um so I was very reticent to accept that term. Um, and I still will, won't don't really refer to myself as it, but I acknowledge that there is roles within that that I, can, I fulfill. You know, if someone looks to me and they're like, yeah, that's what it, that, that is Dag the Priest, I would be like, absolutely fair, fine. If I fulfill that role for you, that is great. I will accept that from you because that is how I fit with you. But for me to kind of adopt that as a, a term I would refer to myself or by which I would refer to myself, well, we go back to my earlier statement. I am the irreverent John O'Sullivan. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the mark, what the tattoo meant and what it still means to me is service. Anyone who's going to be chief and anyone who's going to be priest, anyone who's going to be in that position of authority and position of power, better be in that position of power to serve others mm. that is a chief fundamental baseline as far as i'm concerned if you are in the pay if you are choosing to seek that position of power 
for the sake of having power, for the sake of having recognition or having fame or having any of these other things. Like, yeah, okay, it's, it's okay to pursue those, but the first step has to be service. Mm. I want to be in this role to be of use to people, to my community. That's where priest fits for me more appropriately. And that's kind of where I'm willing to accept that as a term to be attributed to me. Okay, thank you. And for anybody who might be interested in uh, reclaiming the term priest, um, I do have an online class that I have run. Fantastic online class, would absolutely recommend. <laughs> yes. And it's on my website at lauraobrien.net um, forward slash class. And you'll see the downloads there and um, anybody can go in and download it at any time and take that class. So anyway, um, Anani Koo, speaking of uh, fellow priests, um, Anna has just recently joined us in Pagan Life Rights, and um, I'm very honoured to have her as part of our team. We all are. Mm -hmm. um, so Anna had a question. She said, how has your daily life changed since starting to work with himself? And have any of your views on patriarchy changed? So what are the Dagda's views on women's rights if he has ever communicated them to you? Um, Fantastic questions. Very fantastic question. Um, absolutely amazing. Thank you, Anna. Um, my daily life, I think my daily life has become a little bit smoother, if I'm honest, by acknowledging the fact that there's someone bigger than me, they're looking after me as well. Mm. You know? There's someone who has bigger shoulders than I do, and I'm pretty like broad or whatever. Um, <laughs> not compared to him <laughs> but if someone who has bigger shoulders and can carry a bit more than i can no i can, I can carry enough when i need to no it's not <laughs> uh, laura has fantastic shoulders um she should let me rub them more often to relieve the pain and stress and nerve damage that she has there okay john let's, anyway let's move away from our relationship i'm talking about that again. like big d um which i refer to him casually as um and having an awareness of that of him in my corner really kind of has changed what I was always doing because I was always just doing it anyway. I was always just kind of carrying on with my practice, you know, looking after other people, working with them, supporting them, helping them understand that spirituality is part or a facet of your nature as a person and that it doesn't have to be this disparate thing that you practice only every so often. You know, it's something that you should live every day as part of who and what you are. Um, so I think understanding that I'm aligned with him and that the pair of us are in it together has really helped smooth things out. Um, views on the patriarchy. My views on the patriarchy have changed a lot, but I wouldn't say that specifically down to diet. I'd say that's down to my awareness of privilege uh, within my, let me get this right, my sex or, or is it my gender? Probably both. Um, yeah, it would be your gender roles, I suppose, um, yeah. because you identify as male. As male. So, yeah. so the, yeah, the, the specific gender role within the society. Yeah. So um, I think it's my awareness and my growth has happened more so through my relationship with Laura, as well as my sisters, um, who've been very, you know, I've always been. And I would, I would refer to myself as a feminist because you know, things are not in equal balance and I think that if we can get to a position of equilibrium, then as a species, we can go a lot fucking further because at the moment as a species, we're all brutal, like, you know, creatures. Um, we've got a lot of kind of redeeming features, um, but I think there needs to be more done to get to a point of equality. Um, when it comes to his views in regards to that, I can, I, I would say it's, very much aligned like you know i don't want to go all personal notice with this and say that look oh well whatever i say he says absolutely fucking not um i'd say ask him yourself and um, he'd be more than willing to sit and have a chat like, you know pour a cup of tea and just like pour one for you and one for him and um, because he does drink a lot don't pour the same cup of tea or the same drink because long story short involving <laughs> uh, involving someone accidentally committing himself to become the vessel for like, the drinking fest Mm. <laughs> we'll get back to that some other time um, but yeah I think his views on women's position have been 
and always probably will be um, balanced. Like he acknowledges like the role of women within society. Like he's married and has multiple relationships with women and daughter, daughters. You know, there's that kind of connectedness that he has to who and what women are as part of a culture. Now, the Irish culture may have had certain kind of recognized laws around how women were treated and what, like, you know, the rights of the, the woman within society. But there were still kind of bullshit circumstances where, you know, Grania is forced to marry Fionn because of a political kind of bullshits. You know, there's still stories of kind of, you know, love having to flee from oppression, you not know, male oppression, um, because, you know, it wasn't considered, you know, acceptable for females to have that particular choice to have that power now at the same time you do have amazing females like scotha who uh, exists in the in the folklore as this paramount warrior woman and any anyone who wants to be a hero has to be trained by her which means that she's the fucking best that there is and that's it you know so i think the role of women has changed a lot and currently it's gone the wrong way um, for a, quite a while, but we're on a different swing now. And I think we're coming back towards or driving more towards a parity and equality um, that will allow us to kind of go forward together hand in hand. Hmm. And I think he's all in favor of that. Um, I would probably steer the active blade's edge of change to herself, to the Morrigan, if, if you're looking for the agent of change and the manifestation of prophecy into reality, because that's, you know, totally her cup of tea um, or glass of wine or, you know, chalice of blood, whichever it happens to be, I'd go have a chat with her. Um, but I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't find it very surprising if you didn't look over her shoulder and find him standing there nodding along the entire time going, yeah, let's do this. Hmm. Awesome. Um, and I'm just going to get a little bit political here and, you know, whatever, because it's part of our culture and we have to be political. But anybody who is interested in Irish spirituality, we have. So where if, if you're watching this currently, um, hopefully if you're watching this in the future. Hello, future you. And future hopefully we have been we have reached a point in Ireland where women actually have rights over their own physical form because currently what's happening as, as we record this interview, um, there's a thing in Ireland called the eighth amendment, which means that women don't actually have rights over their own physical form when they are carrying a cluster of cells. Um, so not even when it becomes a baby much later on in the game, like literally from conception, that cluster of cells has more, has, has equal rights to a living, breathing, thinking female uh, um, woman or anybody who happens to be pregnant because it's not always women who are pregnant. Um, so that's where we are currently in Ireland. So hopefully if you're in the future, we have already repealed the eighth. So hashtag repeal the eighth. Um, we have already repealed the eighth amendment and women actually have rights over their own bodies because currently women are actually physically, literally dying uh, because we don't have access to safe medical procedures within our country. And that also is down to, primarily mm -hmm. down to the views and the beliefs of um, that particular criminal organization who actually run the country, um, but also a lot of patriarchy. So um, I'm going to leave that for now, but... Yeah, you know. We're also kind of exporting part of the process and care for these women outside of our own country. You know, and as far as, you know, his standpoint on hospitality and taking care of business at home, that's not fucking taking care of business at home. Mm. You know, these yeah. are our people. Anyone living in our, our country is our people. And to force someone going through a difficult time to leave our country, to seek support in a different country. Yeah, I, I <laughs> no, I'm not happy with that. Um... And I don't want to go passing off his feelings on the circumstance and the situation that's the same as mine, but I would be surprised if he's not on the same page as me. Hmm. Okay. Um, so Sally Rose Rivers Robinson, um, who's a big fan of yours, by the way, uh, she was just at a workshop Hi, that, I, <laughs> that I ran in, um, in California there recently in uh, an other world journeying workshop and um, she was singing your praises. She loves you and your work. And why wouldn't she? Rightly so. 
So she had a question. She said, when did you first realize it was the Dagda calling you to get his stories out? So you can answer that one first. Um, when I first began looking into the whole idea of Dagda as a character, the, I had to go back over my own memory and remember the Irish folklore from when I was a, a primary school like child and didn't really exist there. And there was, it was these stories of this kind of large oafish character like you know this person just eats all the food all the time you know and then I began to look into it more and I went through the stories and you know when I began to experience the stories there there were gaps you know it didn't really seem fit that this slovenly oafish big bellied big cock you know large kind of club you know slow rumbling kind of you know caricature of a creature would be chieftain would be leader would be you know someone who would support and like you know be a father figure be the good god of druidic magic you know um so it was a challenge to kind of answer those questions and as i began to look into that the first story i wrote is the first story on the blog which is baking bread mm. and it's the idea that he would just be in himself kind of just baking bread mm. just doing it you know and then, you know, he has himself an interaction with fire as one of the, the grand mediums. And, you know, but then he gets up to go outside. And as he goes outside, that's when he ruffles up his hair. He messes up his clothes and he puts on the demeanor. He puts on the persona of what people would expect of him. But before that moment, he's in his own mind, kind of considering the reality of his existence and or not. He's even just simply going through the act of creating food. It's mindfulness, you know, it's uh, a really entertaining tale and it was, it was intentional. Like, you know, him and me, you know, were beginning to get an understanding of each other as I was kind of seeking him through the stories, seeking to kind of understand what is Dagda and where, where is it coming from? Um, the stories began to flow thick and fast after that. But I think it's when the stories began to add in layers of information that I had no access to myself. I wasn't copying directly from a story. I wasn't inspired, but directly from something. There was just these stories manifesting out of nowhere. Um, that's when I kind of realized it, it was more than just me telling stories of my perception of things and maybe, you know, him telling stories and having me write it down. And mm. um, when I realized that I had myself a little bit of a freak out about it and I left two stories on the shelf. And uh, one of which was the couples forward and the other one was, uh, became uh, the ninth wave. Um, and I had a full on block, I had a full on writer's block of like, nope, hold on, what's happening here? Can we have a moment, please? Um, but then I wrote another story. Um, and that was the only way I could actually begin to rationalize it for myself and to accept that if there is, if, if this relationship with deity exists, you know, if it's not all just crazy in my head then I need to find some parameters for this relationship for me to be able to kind of establish that and go forward with it. And I wrote the story Patience of a Patron and it's actually a now story where he's living in his house, looking out the window at the world going past, table strewn with unfinished written stories and he's just waiting for me to come back and finish them off. And I think that's when I really stepped into the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm writing stories with him. Hmm. Excellent question, Sally. Thank you. So yep, on. how has working with himself given you a better understanding of yourself? Ooh, another good one. Yeah, I, I did have a glance at these. Thank you, Sally. <laughs> really appreciate it. Way to, way, way, way to cut through all of my mystique and my kind of scaly view. Look at them, look at the man behind the curtain. Um, but yeah, no, I, I acknowledge that it, it does have a, a formative influence on me. And I think the thing that really made the most difference is the awareness of the fact that what I've always been is something that has aligned with his understanding of things. Um, an acceptance of self might be the, the simplest term I could put on it. An awareness that, you know, all males don't have to have an Adonis figure. I'm not going to die skinny. Sorry. You know, but that doesn't. Don't apologize me. for that. <laughs> but that doesn't preclude me from being a strong physical character in my life and for other people. 
and sexy. Yeah. Hashtag dagged after dark. <laughs> um, yeah, even that, acknowledging the fact that, you know, sexual appetite and sexual kind of awareness is not an unhealthy thing. Mm. It's, a, it's, it's part of who and what we are. You know, and you don't have to have an Adonis style figure. You don't have to have anything that's particularly, you know, stereotypical, marketed, society based forms to be considered appealing. You know, um, that has been a nice insight as well. But it's the fact that, like, doing the work, like, you know, just I've always been someone who will just do what's needed to get it done. Um, if I got to fall over and black out and have a sleep after that, that's fine. But as, if there's something that has to get done, I'll fucking get it done. And it's a bit reassuring to know that that's the methodology of some divinity out there as well. Hmm. I like it. Um, so the final question is, um, what is one thing, sorry, the final question from Sally, because we're still not done yet. I mean, we're, we're two and a half hours into this interview, <laughs> although we did start a bit late. So we're two hours and 15 minutes, technically. Maybe. So what is one thing you didn't realize you did that was the Dagda moving through you? Now, that's a really interesting one. Um, is it sex, John? Was it sex? No. 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 Okay. Um, that was a triple nope. I'm surprised it was a triple nope. <laughs> um, yeah, no, there was a very clear understanding of like, you know, from especially in our formative early relationship, you and me, Laura, that like, you know, God stay out of the bedroom. Yeah, that, that was, that had to be a rule. That was a very strict rule. Uh, yeah. Like, Fucking you know, perv. Not you, him. I'm, I'm, I'm not concerned about him. <laughs> Yeah, nobody really wants her in the bedroom. <laughs> oh, she's entertaining, absolutely entertaining. But I think it'd be a circumstance of like, uh, let, let, let's have a contracted consensual circumstance here of like this power exchange and what's actually going to be happening and the fact that I do need to be a functioning human being afterwards <laughs> with all of my limbs attached and all of my blood stuff inside, please. Yeah. Well, I say nobody wants her in the bedroom. There are actually people who, who very much do want her in the bedroom. Well, that, that's because she's a sex goddess, Laura. Don't you know that? <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> Fuck off. Anyway, shush. Anyway, anyway back, back to Dagda. Um, back to Dagda. Yeah, no, things I didn't realize I did. That was him moving through me. Um, it's, it's an awkward one, like, because the idea of deity working through me or working through anybody is is absolutely acceptable. You know, there's... There's vast amount of history, lore, topics, practices, mediumship of people making space for deity to move within them, you know, or to move through them or to be manifest in reality by their action. Um, with me personally, I think it's part of the, the large amounts of self-control that I have that um, I'm responsible for everything I do. My actions are my own. Um, so if I was to look at this question and bring it to a place where I probably could answer it, um, I wouldn't say that it was the dagger moving through me. It's probably in, in support of maybe, or parallel with, or kind of assisting with. Um, and I, I probably have to say that, you know, I didn't really realize that a big chunk of my, implacability should we say um would probably be him you know he doesn't move when he plants his feet he just fucking doesn't move he is the immovable object she may be the irresistible force but he is a legit immovable object and you know planting myself planting my feet down upon wherever i happen to be be it my island or not um i think that's something that I get a lot of support when it comes to him. You know, when I kind of put shoulders behind something, you know, you get my shoulders behind it, you got like a pretty strong, blocky human being who'll do all the fucking work that needs to be done. But you get his shoulders behind my shoulders, forget about it. It's, it's Whatever needs to get done, will get done. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's probably the only way I could really answer that question. Like, you know, uh, I'm very clear on what is me and what defines myself. And I have very clear guidelines on what's acceptable through me or anything at all, because it has to be me at the end of the day. But supportive, side by side, working with, 
you know, all those things are, are absolutely appreciable and um, really should be a considered part of anyone's spiritual practice. You know, you need to be able to open yourself up to deity to, you know, access the support and the energy that they can bring for you. But where I am with my process on this, that it has to be me. It has to be true me and my choice because if I define what happens and I'm responsible for what happens, which means that I'm not going to do something that I'm not willing to accept responsibility for. Hmm. Hope that answers that one. Yeah, I think so. Um, I'm just having a quick check. That was actually the last question. Um, we didn't have a question about his club, as Orla pointed out there on the screen. Um, but we did talk about it, so that's fine. And uh, just to clarify, the us kind of joking about sexy, sexy Morrigan and Morrigan being a sex goddess is... Um, Partly because when you look at the commercially available imagery of the Morrigan, um, it's, <laughs> it's all very uh, male gaze and, you know, she, sure, she couldn't even fucking hold a sword. She doesn't have strong arms um, in any of them statues. Well, no, not any of them. I think there's one or two that are, are less cringy than other ones. But um, So it's not that she doesn't have a sexual presence or she doesn't use sexuality or she doesn't um, engage with sexuality. Uh, because she absolutely does, but I would I would be the first one to be fucking slapping somebody upside the head for saying that she is a sex goddess, you know, or a goddess of sex, because I don't it's, think that that's the true. definitions of how they fit. And I have to agree with that at all. Like if you look at the Irish Pantheon, if you look at the two of the Danon, um, the only one who's attributed to, fer to fertility. Well, actually, no, sorry, there's a lot of them because they do everything. You know, they're kind of the 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 gods of all trades. In that, talk to anyone to get anything done, and you'll get it done. Um, you know, if you want to talk to Dagda about, you know, poetry, yeah, you got it. Like, you know, if you want to talk to Lou about blacksmithing, sure, fine. You want to talk to Bridget about blacksmithing, yeah, that's grand. You know, you're going to be able to get all of them to do anything. But, you know, when you attribute fertility, you know, it's one of the things that's specifically put at his doorstep mm. um, by definition of the role. Um, and he's subject to the same thing. And look, this is where I mentioned, like Laura mentioned, the male gaze. The male gaze still applies. And it's the male gaze applying to male deity as well. It's not the female gaze who demand six packs and abs and muscles. You know, that's that's a patriarchal circumstance of this Adonis form. And he's not that. You know, I've seen some lovely kind of artwork done by various people um, of the idea of this imagery. Um but when you look at sculpted body, when you, like, and I've done some, you know, gym work and body work myself in my time, you know, when you look at what is someone who has a, a worker's body versus a bodybuilder's body, bodybuilders are built for definition. They're not built for strength. You know, when you actually have someone who needs to get themselves down to show a six pack, to show defined muscles, that's actually a, a significant diet. You're actually like, you know, not eating, like you're eating healthily, but you're not eating to build body fat you're, or muscle. Like you're building to be, build definition, but you're actually starving your body so that you get the definition around your form. You know, if you want to look specifically for a body form that would fit diet, that you've got to be looking at strongman competition. None of those have defined abs. None of those lads have defined muscle shape. They're blocky. They're built for work. They're built for lifting. They're built for carrying. They're built for moving. You know, that is like this form. And yes, he is a bit of a gut. You know, that is a shape that he actually has because, you know, he has the, the luxury of being well off. You know, in a society where people would starve to death on a regular basis in ancient Ireland, you know, when it was hunter-gatherer and you couldn't catch that deer, you were fucking eating grass, you know? But that had a, a gut, you know? And that was a substantial circumstance and a big difference. And it showed that there was wealth, there was opulence, and there was kind of a well-established circumstance of available food sources and he wasn't shy in sharing it though and that's where the hospitality kind of t k k kicks in as well so if you see statues out there with you know dagda obviously doing leg day or dagda not missing abs day it's great i'm sure that's their individual experience of deity in the same way that you know you know sex goddess morrigan with the the body armor that's just a bra forget about it you know, in my personal opinion, like, you know, again, it's how in, in each individual interacts with deity in their own way. Um, but if you want to really look for the form of Dagda in something that you can understand or appreciate as closely approximating to human, you want to be looking at strongman circumstances, like the people who are built for 
work because he's a worker you know Mm. hope that helps um and again it's the impact of patriarchy and male gaze even on male form Mm. um that's the expectation of this adonis style figurine because it doesn't apply to everybody and it really shouldn't Mm. yeah and i mean all of that being said we're also talking about deities so you know they they may or may not have a physical form at any given time you know or appear to have a physical form so it's all very very subjective um but yeah the the irish pantheon in my experience are always very very uh, practical and so it makes a lot of sense to me that dagda would would look like a feckin strong man or a caber tosser or you know a, a, a big solid rugby playing backer or you know sorry i've yeah. probably got the terminology wrong there but you know um a forward a forward okay yeah probably a prop forward the biggest ones maybe, maybe a hooker <laughs> not that kind of hooker <laughs> dag, to, dag to the hooker okay gotcha hashtag dag the rugby <laughs> hashtag hooker dag, dag. Whoa, <laughs> Whoa. that's a whole different dag to after dark um Okay, so we are going to finish up there. Thank you so much. Like I said, you're feckin' heroes for for going through all this. And um, you're very welcome. It's been a pleasure to chat to John uh, in public because, you you know, we have these kind of conversations in private all the time. So um, it's (laughs) a kitchen table. I know, right? It's a little bit weird to kind of, yeah, (laughs) to to do this. in for for the for the public consumption um but it's good you know and it's part of the um it's part of the community service obviously that we do that we both do and it is officially after dark now tori yes hi tori tori all the way in um in california it is currently in ireland 11 36 p.m and i still have an article to finish before i can go to bed (laughs) my tech difficulties earlier (laughs) meant that i didn't get all my work finished and um, i have a full day of work tomorrow so i have to do it tonight so um yes and it is bloody freezing as kathy says absolutely Um, legit bloody freezing bleeding freezing in ireland um but you know it's winter time so what else would it be it's it's getting rid of all the the midges so and the wasps so <laughs> don't be worrying about it too much yeah. um so all of the links um that we have referred to through the chat or through the um through the interview sorry i'm retired through the interview uh, are in the chat log um and after we record or after we download the files and um, everybody on the mailing list will be getting access to the folder with all of them in it so you will have a copy of the chat log there so you'll have all the links that we referred to through the interview excuse me um, apart from that um, once this interview goes up on youtube in a couple of weeks time um, we will put the links in the description box below so wherever you're you're watching you'll have access to everything that we've uh, all the resources that we've um, we've mentioned and if you want to support John and his awesome work, um, please go to patreon.com forward slash Dagda, D-A-G-D-A. Um, if you want to sign up for these type of interviews, not with John every month, but um, myself every month, uh, we'll be interviewing somebody else on how they do these Irish spirituality things. So th- they don't all go on this long, I promise, um, except for Daimler. <laughs> Into, into yeah. no no you're, you're you're good you're good um so yeah we do so sign up to my mailing list which is lauraobrien.net forward slash community and um, there's all sorts of stuff on my website have a look through it and um i also have a patreon as well which has been on the screen patreon.com forward slash laura o'brien and it's l-o-r-a o-b-r-i-e-n for anybody listening on the mm-hmm. audio and and not getting the visuals okay so yeah. There's Thank one you. Last thing I'd like to pop yes. in, Laura, yes, as yes, well. Of course. Um, as I started off mentioning earlier on, there's not a lot of stuff, not a lot of people talking about Dagda. There's not a lot of kind of people mentioning his name in Ireland. And there are people like the awesome, lovely Tori and such who are keeping space for him outside of my island. And I'm fucking delighted to have, to have connected and engaged with them. I mentioned Scott as well. And Branwen is another person who does. Um, what I would say is that, you know, he would love to hear from people you know he'd love to kind of like be acknowledged even if it's just a how are you how's it going um i have a facebook group which is called the dagda's hearth um h-e-a-r-t-h and it's just an open kind of forum for people to kind of come in and kind of sit and gather to kind of talk dagda or just you know talk together to just share a space and you know 
the way I've found with this guy is if you make him, if you make space for him, he'll fill it. Um, so you can kind of just pop in there to just connect with other people who want to connect and chat and talk. Hmm. Thank you. And thank you for that resource. Um, there is also the Morrigan's Cave. Um, so people can go and they can have one or the other or both. Because, you know, we can love be, a bit of both. We love a bit of both. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> oh God, we're in so much trouble. <laughs> you are. I'm not. We're good. <laughs> okay. How many times? How many times does somebody want to actually um, count, go back through the interview and count how many times I've had to say, moving swiftly on, um, mm -hmm. we will finish the interview and we're just at two and a half hours. So um, thanks, John, for your time and your effort and your energy. And thank you for the work that you do, um, both in our family and out in the world and in the pagan community. It's very, very much appreciated. Hashtag just John. Hashtag <laughs> do the work. <laughs> Well, it is very appreciated. Okay, so Slán people, um, we are delighted that you have been uh, here with us through all this epic marathon journey. Um, and thank you very much for your time, your energy, and your continued work within our communities because we can't be doing all this on our own, okay? So see you later. Bye. Bye, Slán. <laughs>